me us all. Good morning. I want to welcome you to our first uh, oversight hearing on the implementation of the District of Columbia Financial Responsibility and Management Assistance Authority Act of 1995. When the 104th Congress took office in January 1995, the District of Columbia was in the midst of an unprecedented financial and budget crisis. There were very real concerns that at any time the city might run out of cash to meet debt service or payroll. Although dealing with the financial problems of our nation's capital were not at the top of the Republican legislative agenda, the seriousness of the city's crisis was recognized immediately. The House leadership, along with this subcommittee, did not hesitate to move quickly and boldly to save the city. In this case, we were anxious to save the city both in the sense of preserving home rule and in the sense of helping it to find ways to rescue itself from its fiscal and financial failings. It would not have been possible to accomplish any of this without the active involvement and cooperation of both Democrats and Republicans, especially the cooperation of the ranking member of this subcommittee, Delegate Eleanor Holmes Norton, who worked tirelessly not only to represent her city and constituents to this body, but who also worked extraordinarily hard to explain the issues and the need for action to the people of Washington. Now, almost a year after passage and nine months after the President appointed the members of the authority, it's time to begin the important and necessary work of looking into the implementation of Public Law 104-8, how well it's working, whether it needs updating, and whether all involved parties understand the role they have in rescuing and reviving the nation's capital city. This hearing is more than just looking at the control board itself because there was much more to the law than just the creation of a board. The district's budget process was revised. Two powerful positions were created inside the city government, chief financial officer and inspector general, to work within the government. A window was opened to the Treasury for dealing with the district's cash and short-term budget problems since its bond rating had slipped, slipped to junk status. I would have preferred to have had this first oversight hearing last year because of the extraordinary federal and district budget situations that did not happen. We will deal with this situation by trying to cover major issues of immediate importance today and having another oversight hearing later. Now, that's, that, now that so much time and so many events have passed, we're playing catch up. Maybe that's not all bad because the city, the control board, the CFO and IG have all had a chance to get used to each other and go through a round or two of resolving on their own the inevitable differences that are natural and unavoidable part of starting up such a large undertaking such as this. It's not my intent, nor do I believe that it should be Congress's role to involve itself intimately in the relationship between the control board and the city. If we wanted to do that, we could have dispensed with the board altogether and just taken over the city last year. Our role should be to monitor the situation, make certain that all parties understand and carry out their effort, their part of the effort, and be prepared to deal with major problems in the underlying statute or its implementation if and when they occur. On the subject of major problems, I'd like to take note of something that was in the media recently and that I think should be misunderstood, it could be misunderstood in a way that skews the way that Public Law 104-8 was intended to work. The whole thrust of the law is to create one team to rescue and revive Washington, D.C. This is one case where it's true that if you're not part of the solution, then you're part of the problem. There should be no concept of competition except in the sense that everyone has to be on the Washington, D.C. team. One of the biggest lessons we learned in our hearings last year was that control boards must work closely with the city government and vice versa. People can't be rescued if they don't believe they're in trouble. But on the other hand, if the rescuer thinks that it has a monopoly on solutions or that only it has the will to make real and permanent changes, then the result will be controversy in an adversarial relationship. In the long run, this would ill serve the city and those who attempt to rescue it. This is the first time that all the members of the control board have testified before Congress. I want to thank these civic-spirited individuals. They receive no financial compensation for the long hours of service they give to this city. Their sole purpose is to assist the district in its efforts to return to financial stability and managerial efficiency. I'm confident that every action taken by the authority is taken in light of its mission to assist the district. The control board was not established to make policy choices. Policy choices were properly and deliberately left to the locally elected officials. The control board was, however, established to make sure that the policy choices made by local officials were made in light of accurate financial data and that the elected officials consider and account for the full costs of their policy decisions before they act. This means that the control board is responsible for ensuring that the city is on a path that leads to financial stability and that side excursions or distractions do not cause the district to stray from the right path. 
Just because the control board does much of its work in private does not absolve them from their responsibility to communicate effectively with the residents of the District of Columbia, the members of the City Council, members of the local executive, and the Congress. I can't emphasize enough the importance of frequent, effective communications, both public and private, among all the responsible parties involved in this process. Everyone has an important contribution to make. Many of the things that the control board must do to carry out its mission need to be explained fully and clearly to the public, as well as to government officials. In the absence of clear and cogent explanations, even the best decisions can have the appearance of being either arbitrary or capricious. I don't think the board has always acted in a way that best communicates what it's found and what it's doing to those it serves. I don't want this failure to provide a complete explanation of the reasons behind decisions to be misunderstood. Every problem, every hard decision, every much needed innovation provides an opportunity for the control board to highlight the fact that the district is moving forward on the path to recovery. There are those who, perhaps suffering from unrealistically high expectations, are frustrated with the district's progress to date and are either urging the control board to do more or believe that it's already failed. Some want the control board to order all sorts of extraordinary and even illegal actions by the district government. Others seem to have an unrealistic expectation of the control board moving immediately to secure substantial new resources to continue the district government at its old size and performance levels. Both of these assumptions are wrong. Before the control board can move effectively to help the district solve its problems itself, it must be able to ascertain exactly where the district is and where the problems are. This takes time and resources. The nature and degree of the district government's problems have required extensive investigation. I hope to hear today that much of that activity has been completed and that real and publicly evident progress is near to hand. By the same token, those who thought that the control board would act as the cavalry coming over the hill with trunks of cash or federal assumption of large parts of the government must not have been listening when Congress stated clearly that the district had a spending problem above all else. Until acknowledgment of that fact and real efforts to control spending in the government itself, further financial assistance would only have exacerbated the problem, not solved them. I believe that the Mayor's transformation plan goes a long way towards setting the groundwork for dealing with some of the larger issues, such as the proper functions of the district government and the unfunded pension liability. Issues have been raised about the board venturing into the policy arena. Others are concerned about the control board venturing too deeply into individual personnel matters. Still others have maintained that the control board and its staff lack experience in local government and, in essence, don't know what they're doing. None of these criticisms are completely true, but neither are they completely without merit. They are completely natural outcome of the new situation all of these parties find themselves in today. The most difficult situation for all of us to deal with so far may well be the extraordinary set of circumstances that, existed, that have existed for the past six months. I look forward with some trepidation to hearing from all of the witnesses how events both within and beyond their control have impacted the City's ability to move forward. In this regard, consider each of the following points, both individually and as a whole. First, the control board wasn't appointed until June of 1995, after the council had finished the FY 1996 budget. The startup of the board had to take place in the midst of restarting the budget process. Second, the FY 1996 district budget, which should have been brought to the House floor in June, didn't arrive until August. There were still many questions about the budget and the control board's actions on it after it arrived. Third. Despite Herculean efforts by the Appropriations Committee, which had to deal with some matters not normally within its purview, the 1996 budget was not passed by October 1, 1995. Fourth, because the Appropriation Bill was not passed, only part of the federal payment was made available to the district in the first continuing resolution, and not the entire $660 million that the Control Board in the City had been counting on to be available. Fifth. One of the most important provisions of Public Law 104-8, the Chief Financial Officer, wasn't appointed until October of 1995. Therefore, all of the important functions of that office were not present for almost five months after the Control Board was appointed. Sixth, when the Federal Government shut down in November, so did the District. Seventh, when the Federal Government shut down again in December, the District stayed open at the behest of the Congressional leadership, but constantly had to consider whether it should shut down as a matter of law. Eighth, when it came time to enact a 1996 supplemental budget to better deal with changed circumstances, the district still did not have an approved original 1996 budget from which to work. Ninth, another key element of Public Law 104-8, the Enhanced Inspector General did not take office until January 1996. 
The vital audit systems review and investigation work of that office were thus seven full months delayed from the date of the appointment of the control board. Ten, even now, as the City and the Control Board work on the 1997 budget and the four-year financial plan, there is no official and legal 1996 budget. This raises severe concerns of how to budget prospectively. When do you not know what your current budget really is? As we sit here today, the district is within about two weeks of running out of cash or of once again delaying payments to vendors and Medicaid providers, while more than $200 million of the federal payment is still due. This incredible situation has to have had a profound and negative impact on the ability of the control board and the city government to move forward. The necessity of, spend, of expending so much of the district's limited resources, especially top-level management, on these constant crises must be taken into account when anyone, the public, Congress, or the press, considers what progress has or has not been made up until now. What the District of Columbia needs above all else is a period of stability and calm so that plans can be completed and actions can be started. I will do what I can to see that stability prevails and I anticipate significant progress if that happens. I would now yield to my colleague, Ms. Norton, the ranking member of the subcommittee for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize for my tardiness and uh, thank the chairman for his indulgence. I was in Canada on a one day visit of women members of Congress with women parliamentarians and have just arrived at Dulles. Uh, I want to welcome today's witnesses and say, and say how pleased I am to receive all of you for your first report to the Congress. And I want to thank Chairman Davis for organizing this hearing. May I thank him as well for postponing the hearing as originally scheduled until all concerned could have their own meetings. The mayor, the authority, and the relevant staff have had several meetings, including one with me, and I congratulate all for their efforts in resolving organizational and other issues. Almost a year ago, Congress rushed to establish the District of Columbia Financial Responsibility and Management Assistance Authority before the spring recess because of fear that the district could have a payless payday or other financial catastrophe while Congress was out on its district work period. However, the authority was established not only to enable the district to borrow money, but also to help reform its, opera its operations so that the city would again be able to borrow on its own. The authority has had to work under the most trying of circumstances. Lacking a financial information system, the district and the authority have nevertheless had to generate financial information without assurance of its reliability. Moreover, the, the authority was established between two budget cycles and thrust into oversight of congressionally mandated cuts in a crisis atmosphere. The authority carried out the mandate to assure cuts, but then urged the Congress to cut no further until the city and the authority could engage in the analysis necessary to restructure and re-engineer district functions. The House ignored the careful and rational recommendation of its own agent and required the authority to force fresh, immediate cuts on the district. New cuts without a plan set back the possibility that financial recovery could begin this fiscal year. But Congress went further. It shut down the district for a week and on three separate occasions thereafter forced the city to again prepare for possible shutdowns. Moreover, in an unprecedented delay, Congress has yet to enact a major part of the federal payment six months into the fiscal year. Thus, in, in the midst of the district's fiscal waterloo, Congress has intruded itself as a major factor assuring defeat at least for the time being. The new cuts and the delayed federal payment have kept the authority in a crisis management mode since its creation. This has delayed the real work of saving money recognized and mandated by the authority legislation, and, and that, of course, is the complete overhaul of district operations. 
until the authority and the city can get to this work in earnest and residents can see improvements in city services, a most important mission of the authority legislation will remain unmet. The authority has struggled as well with the complexities and compromises embodied in the legislation itself. None of the problems in the way the statute is drawn are there by accident, however. They are there by design. The design was to get the job done while saving as much home rule as possible, pure and simple. The expectation was that the individuals involved would make the statute work. As with everything else in this world, success is driven by people, not by the laws they administer. District officials have not done their best to make the compromises in the statute work. The district knows what I went through in fighting back proposals by some in the Senate and the House that would have retracted wholesale entire blocks of home rule. I am therefore particularly disappointed whenever the district does not do its best to make the compromises the city desired and that the city got work well. At the same time, most observers expected that the district would have trouble adjusting to sharing power it had exercised alone since 1974 when Home Rule was enacted. The challenge and the charge of the authority was to help develop procedures and relationships so that the adjustment would be made. To help ensure that this would happen, I engaged in an exhausting struggle here to ensure that all members of the authority would be Washingtonians with a healthy respect for home rule that is so highly valued in this democracy deficient city. I want to commend the authority and the city for the efforts they have made, especially recent meetings among themselves that have achieved significant progress. I will place into the record the agreements reached at the meeting held with the parties in my office after all have had an opportunity to look at the memorandum. Further steps will be needed as well, however. I have listed some of them in the memo I will attach. I want to reiterate that I stand ready whenever called upon to use my good offices to help establish administrative systemic remedies to problems raised by the statute or otherwise. Finally, in reviewing the statute in preparation for this hearing, I have concluded that the compromises that saved home rule are indeed workable if all work at it. One example is the chief financial officer provision. The functions and personnel of the financial cluster are all explicitly committed to the CFO, including the offices of treasurer, controller, budget, financial information services, and finance and revenue. The CFO appoints the treasurer, controller, and director of financial information services, the latter two with the approval of the mayor. The mayor retains the right to appoint the budget director and the director of finance and revenue, only because these are cabinet positions. But even here, he must get the approval of the authority for these cabinet appointments. Great concessions are made to the authority and to the CFO in the authority legislation. The CFO must move forward to exercise control over the functions and personnel of the financial cluster as mandated by the statute. The district must do nothing to impede him, and the authority and the district must help him work out the personal and official relationships. I am pleased to see how all involved are successfully accomplishing this goal now. I am certain that the CFO issue and others can and will be worked through without intervention by Congress 
to curtail home rule. I have full confidence in the ability of the authority and the district to make the authority legislation as enacted work as enacted. In any case, as the only member of Congress from the district, I have no intention whatsoever of presiding over or aiding and abetting the end of hard-won, much beleaguered home rule. I am sure that on reflection, none of the parties would want any less. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Norton, thank you very much. I am now pleased to introduce and welcome our first panel of witnesses, which consists of the five presidentially appointed members of the Financial Responsibility and Management Assistance Authority, better known as the Control Board. This is the first time all five members will be testifying before Congress, an occasion we have eagerly awaited. The five members are Dr. Andrew F. Bremer, a former member of the Federal Reserve Board who serves as the Chairman of the Authority, Constant Barry Newman, Under Secretary of the Smithsonian Institution and former head of the Federal Office of Personnel Management, Dr. Joyce A. Ladner, former President of Howard University, Stephen D. Harlan, Vice Chairman of the Authority and President of H.G. Smithy Company, and Edward A. Singletary, former Vice President and Secretary of Bell Atlantic Corporation. As you have been advised, it is the policy of this committee that all witnesses be sworn before they may testify. I ask you all to please rise with me and raise your right hand. Solemnly swear that the testimony you will give this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. Be <coughs> seated. Um, the subcommittee will carefully review any written statements that uh, you care to submit, and I ask that any oral testimony be limited to about 10 minutes. Uh, I'm going to make the same request of all other witnesses for the practical reason that we have to vacate this hearing room by noon. Uh, as all interested parties know from the notice that went out, this hearing was supposed to start at 8.30 a.m., but was compelled to start later for a variety of last-minute reasons. We, of course, want to have sufficient time after your opening statements uh, for questions. Thank you and all subsequent witnesses for your cooperation. Uh, before you commence, permit me to note that you are all key players in our ongoing efforts to revive the fiscal condition of the District of Columbia. I fully understand that you have been functioning for only about eight months. It took the District a lot more than eight, done, eight months to get into its present morass. It will take more than eight months for the District to recover. Uh, we are looking to you to not only exercise the leadership role Congress mandated in Public Law 104-8, but to work closely and effectively with the CFO and IG and with the rest of the district government, the D.C. team. We look forward to hearing from you on a regular and ongoing basis about what you have done, what you are doing, and what you plan to do, and what we can do together. Uh, you are all, in effect, unpaid volunteers serving a three-year term, which I am sure must occasionally be, be viewed by you as three-year sentences. Um, we have given you a great uh, power to put the district on a glide path to economic solvency and prosperity. I want you all to know how deeply we appreciate your hard work and dedication our occasional differences to the contrary notwithstanding. We will now hear from Chairman Bremer on behalf of the D.C. Financial Responsibility and Management Assistance Authority. Thank Dr. you very Bremer. much, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, members. Mr. Chairman, you have already introduced the members of the panel, and they, we are all here. Uh, the members have reviewed my statement, so I am testifying in this statement on behalf of the uh, full board. But individual members are prepared to respond to questions. I have already asked whether each one would want to make an additional statement. They have all said they would not wish to do so, but they are prepared to respond to questions which you may raise. The full statement, Mr. Chairman, uh, is fairly long, and I would accept your invitation to include all of it in the record, and I will simply highlight uh, several features of this statement. As you know, the authority was established in April 1, 1995, and the main purpose was to help the city improve its overall financial stability and to help improve services. There were other objectives specified as well, but these stand out. Mr. Chairman, we believe that the law has been making, we have been making progress under the law. I will cite several of these, but for the most part, we should all accept the fact that we began this effort under very trying conditions. We should also remember that the city's financial condition did not develop overnight, and it will not 
improve overnight. Yet, we are all prepared to work hard at that improvement, and the efforts I will describe today demonstrate that we have been dedicating ourselves, we've been working very hard, and we are convinced we will make further progress. Since its form formation last summer, the authority has worked hard to maintain constructive relations with city officials, while at the same time ensuring itself sufficient independence to carry out its function. Sadly, I must report that the District of Columbia remains today, almost a year after the passage of the law, in very serious financial condition. Without dramatic action in coming weeks, the city's cash position will turn particularly dire. Obtaining the rest of the federal payment now tied up in the appropriations bill is extremely important to the district. Those funds already critically needed are only one part of this solution. The authority has concluded after months of study that additional short-term resources are needed to ease the district's immediate financial crisis. The authority in the near future will work closely with the mayor, the district council, the president, and the Congress to identify funding sources to eliminate this crisis. I should mention at this point, Mr. Chairman, and I know that my colleagues agree with me, that the conditions in the which the district finds itself is much worse, is much worse than we anticipated when President Clinton appointed us as members of the authority. Cash shortages, the size of the deficit, the vendor payment problems, dwindling resources, decaying infrastructure, and hamstrung agencies all seem worse than we originally expected. And while I believe there is much cause for hope, including the fiscal year 1997 financial planning budget recently put forward by the mayor, no one should underestimate our financial plight and the amount of time, effort, and cooperation from all who care about this city that would be necessary for us truly to revitalize the district. We were asked particularly to um, um, share with the committee the progress we have made. Now, our fiscal situation did not deteriorate overnight, as I already said, and it will take a great deal of effort to um, um, move the city forward. But I would want to repeat what the chairman said earlier. Uh, this is a relatively new institution. The chief financial officer has been in place only five months, and the inspector general arrived only in January. The fiscal situation has been complicated by the unexpected delay and passage of the appropriations bill that was already noted. Only now, with the fiscal year 1997 financial planning budget, will the authority have an opportunity fully to influence the course of the district's budget formulation. And I want to digress for a moment, Mr. Chairman, to say that in that appropriations bill, at least in the conference print, there is additional authority, the additional powers for us, and we would like very much uh, to have those so we can proceed in carrying out our recommendation. So the failure not only holds up the balance of the federal payment, but it also holds up uh, some instruments of administration which we need. And we have made some recommendations to uh, uh, um, modify some of those, and we will reiterate those and submit some language for the record on those, Mr. Yeah, Chairman. Without objection, they'll be entered into the record. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. Let me just also, if I could, recognize the chairman of our full committee, Bill Klinger, who's just come in. Chairman Klinger, we appreciate you being here with us this morning. Thank you, Thank you very much. Go, go ahead and proceed. Thank Dr. you. Um, now, the headlines are full of bad news about the district. What the media does not as readily relate to the public is the progress made by the authority and the city itself under the act. Several months ago, this authority was what you see here today. The volunteer unpaid members, uh, five of us, Today, we have a staff of 27 hardworking professionals, including CPAs, lawyers, MBAs, MPAs, and economists, all together, overall, a group of dedicated people without whom we, the members of the authority, could not effectively function. 
We have worked hard to fulfill the requirements and mandates of the law. Section 203 stipulates that we may review contracts into which the district proposed to enter. To date, we have reviewed more than 1,000 such contracts with a cumulative average process and time of about one week, and we have approved more than 95% of them. During the month of February, our average contract process and time was four days. Our review of contracts has suggested many needed changes in the district procurement operations. I want to stress that. In the process of approving contracts, we have noted that there are needed changes in the district procurement operations, and we are now working closely with city officials and others to seek improvements likely to save millions of dollars. Section 203 requires that we review all district legislation. We have examined more than 40 legislative acts and have approved all but three of them. In November, we disapproved the Budget Support Temporary Act and suggested several changes which were subsequently included in a revised Budget Support Act that the board approved. <coughs> Excuse me. The, um, <coughs> last month, the authority disapproved the fiscal year 1996 supplemental budget as passed by the council. We believed that the act's addition of $87 million to the district's deficit would be fiscally irresponsible. The authority instead sent back to the council allocation of $129 million in cuts to make the $4.994 billion budget ceiling imposed by the Congressional Appropriations Conference Committee. Moreover, in many of the acts deemed approved by the authority, our staff has worked closely with the staff of the council to improve legislative language and fiscal impact. But again, we have worked uh, substantially on the range of issues that have been put before us. The authority has done much more, of course. Since our creation, we have sought extensive outreach in the community. Members of the authority and its executive director and general counsel have participated in nearly 200 discussions, panels, and other forums in every ward of the city. We have had two hearings at which the public at large was invited to testify and we have held 18 public meetings and public hearings in the conduct of our business. And I could go on to describe additional activities which we have engaged in and the kind of effort we have made to enhance our relations with the city. We have also had, <coughs> excuse me, uh, extensive contacts. Um, <coughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Our contacts with labor organizations and the business community have borne fruit as well. For instance, we have received many excellent suggestions from labor groups about ways to cut costs and improve services. With regard to corporate citizens, the authority and Ford Motor Company, last month, as an example of the kind of cooperation I, I have in mind, um, uh, the authority and Ford Motor Company announced last month an arrangement in which all of the district's four emergency police, fire, and public works vehicles will be repaired and maintained through a $750,000 line of credit provided by Ford and guaranteed by the authority. The district vehicles will receive expedited attention at Ford repair shops, and the district vehicle technicians will receive training at Ford's regional repair center at no cost to the district. The authority applauds Ford's corporate citizenship and we encourage others to seek similar creative ways to help their city in this time of need. Mr. Chairman, I would like to turn now to the authority's relationship with the district government. We are keenly aware the authority is not the elected government of the District of Columbia. In being sensitive to our appointed role, we have in the last seven months sought as much as possible <coughs> me, to work through and in collaboration with the city's elected executive and legislative representatives. As mentioned earlier in my testimony, authority members and staff in, uh, in the conduct of our work have frequently met and regularly consulted with the mayor, the city administrator, the chief financial officer, the inspector general, the board of education, city agencies, the chairman and members of the city council, and the staff of all of the aforementioned offices. We have generally had constructive and mutually beneficial relationship and the result is has, um, <coughs> has generally been more positive and effective than public policies and procedures, have resulted in effective public policies and procedures. Two weeks ago, the authority held a retreat with the mayor and his senior officials 
Last week, we had a retreat with members of the council and their senior staff. As one might expect in any democratic tradition such as ours, that also includes a control board. There have at times been respectful disagreements between parties, yet in all candor, these disagreements typically arise from honest differences about roles and responsibilities of or from different interpretations. Um, nonetheless, the Congress, through public law, gave the authority certain powers to ensure that responsible financial or governance of the district was carried out. The authority has used those powers, and we will continue to use them when we, be we believe that other methods are ineffective or exhausted. As mentioned, the authority has disapproved certain legislation passed by the district. The authority has also issued orders to obtain information to compel actions that it believe would not be forthcoming otherwise. We have issued detailed instructions to the financial to the chief financial officer regarding the appropriate allotment of fiscal year 1996 funds as mandated by the Congress. The, appoint the apportionment of $129 million in cuts has been given as guidance to the chief financial officer who is currently providing de detailed instruction to city agencies. If necessary, this guidance will be followed by an order to ensure that agencies keep within the mandated limits. At this point, Mr. Chairman, I would like to turn aside for a moment and mention another area of concern to us, and, um, and I would then be prepared to answer whatever questions you would like. Um, we have concluded, after much discussion, that the chief financial officer needs greater flexibility in order to carry out his responsibilities. Um, we concluded earlier this year that legislation was required to realign and make clear the line of authority and the um, responsibilities of the CFO. Um, we have had a number of discussions uh, in that regard. Um, we have concluded, however, that we would not at this moment, um, ask the Congress to enact that legislation immediately. We did so because it is my understanding that the mayor has agreed to delegate to the chief financial officer the authorities which the CFO feels he needs. I say I understand that that has happened because, uh, in, in fortunately, um, 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 that discussion took place when neither, when no member of the control board was present. But um, we believe that if the mayor delegates that authority to the CFO, and if he does it quickly, um, that would achieve, that would provide the flexibility that the CFO needs. On the other hand, if that is not done, if it is not done quickly, Mr. Chairman, we will be right back here asking that the law be changed. Uh, thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. I asked my colleagues as we got underway whether they wanted to make an additional statement. They said no, and so all of us are now prepared to respond to your question. Well, let thank me just say much. I'm going to have questions for each of your colleagues, but. Uh, they obviously are the veterans of many hearings uh, when they uh, said that. I can appreciate that. We appreciate it. Let me just uh, ask a, f a few questions, if I could. Uh, Dr. Brimmer, my staff has been contacted by more than one city agency about the allocations that the authority has made for the rest of 1996. Particularly in light of yesterday's activities at UDC, could you address the question of whether the authority has ordered any spending reductions that would close city agencies or institutions for months at a time? Or, or would require 40, 60, or, or 80 furlough days by the end of the year? No, Mr. Chairman, we have not. Um, um, there has been, as you indicated, a good deal of, of um, confusion over this. Let me say quickly what happened. Um, <coughs> the um, ceiling of $4.994 um, um, uh, billion was set by the Congress. In addition, we were instructed to allocate the difference between the original budget proposal of $5 billion, $123 million, and $4.994 billion. 
roughly $129 million. Uh, we proceeded to uh, make those allocations after discussion with and receiving recommendations from the mayor and the council. Um, we issued guidance to the CFO to assure that the agencies live within the lower budget ceilings which we um, determined to be appropriate. At the same time, in carrying out uh, those um, instructions, the CFO noted, observed, that there are some agencies, some agencies, not many, but some agencies are already spending at rates substantially in excess of the ceiling. Some agencies, and, and the UDC in particular, since you mentioned that one, uh, exceeded its budget a year ago and has, done, has not taken any actions to indicate that it was responding to the um, um, guidance that had been given. And by all indications, it looked as though and the CFO was convinced that the UDC, along with some other agencies, would exceed their ceiling. And so additional guidance was given. We said to the CFO that all agencies should be allowed to spend up to 100% of their allocation at a rate that would keep them within that, except in those cases where an agency indicated or at least demonstrated through its actions or lack of actions that it was likely to exceed its ceiling, then the CFO should be able to Im impose special restraints to assure that they would get under and remain under the ceiling. That is the background of the issue you just raised. Um, and um, apparently, and I say apparently because I don't know, um, apparently there was some interpretation of that uh, guidance at UDC suggesting that um, the, um, their allotment was being cut. That was not the case, Mr. Chairman. Um, there, we know of no case where an agency um, um, is operating on the assumption that they are being cut below their actual seat. Well, and in point of fact, if someone felt their agency had been ordered to cut too far, they would be allowed to make their case to the authority, and they should be prepared to do that. Isn't that the appropriate mechanism? They would be, precisely. And uh, they have been told that they would be first stop, and I want to stress this, <coughs> the first stop is the CFO. Um, um, we would not encourage any agency to come to the control board to lobby. Uh, they should make their case with the CFO. And, of course, if they feel that uh, they are not um, uh, getting a fair hearing, of course, they're free to come to us. But the first stop is the CFO. Let me just ask you, you talked about the $4.994 billion ceiling. That's technically not in effect, is it, until Congress acts on the budget? Am I right on that? That is correct, Mr. Chairman. Um, Congress's <coughs> failure to act basically is uh, uh, we're not being able to carry out the mandate that members would like to do. Isn't, isn't that the reality? That is right, <coughs> and that is a matter um, of which we struggle a great deal. Um, we did receive uh, a mandate to do the cut. That's in the law. Um, I also sought out and, and got counsel from the chairs of the appropriation subcommittees, and I have a letter signed jointly by the chairs of those subcommittees and appropriation for the district saying that they were highly confident that when the legislation was finally adopted, it would contain the 4.9. And I think it will. I think it will. But I, and this is really more just to my colleagues than to all of you, is that the longer we put off a budget, that we don't get these kind of limitations that members of Congress uh, want to put on. I agree. We, we end up uh, uh, really at cross purposes to what we're trying to do. Let me just, I've got more questions, but I want to just uh, go through protocol and acknowledge the chairman of our full committee, uh, Honorable Bill Klinger, and ask if he'd like to ask any questions at this time. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm delighted that you're holding this hearing. I think it's important that uh, we have an opportunity to bring before us all of the players in this uh, ongoing saga. And Dr. Brimmer, we're delighted to have you and the members of the authority here. I think it's uh, 
uh, it's, it's good that you're here to give us a report. One of the, 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 one of the things I wanted to ask you, Dr. Bremer, was uh, you mentioned the, the need you felt to provide the CFO with more flexibility, and you talked about uh, the understanding of, of an arrangement that the, uh, the mayor had agreed to that. What, in what way did you feel that the CFO was limited, or why, why was there a need? What, what do you really envisage as a need for the CFO in terms of more flexibility? Yes, um, and the CFO is here, and he will appear, and I would um, um, hope that he would be able to answer that more fully. Um, but the CFO said, that he needed, had tried to get flexibility and make an appointment. Um, one concrete example, uh, he felt he needed uh, to make a change. He went in, looked at the, the establishment that was already there, personnel, and concluded that in one particular slot, uh, vital to him, he needed to make a change. Um, um, that was resisted initially. Um, and um, um, he also, uh, said that he needed to realign reporting arrangements and there was reluctant to do that. And in fact, I believe that the order which would achieve that has been on the uh, exec chief executive's desk for quite some time and still has not been signed. At least if it's been signed, I have not been signed. Things like this, not um, simply uh, conceptual matters, but day-to-day -day practical uh, ways of getting the job done. But your understanding that the mayor has agreed to uh, provide that kind of flexibility or would defer to the chief financial officer in those areas? Yes, sir, that is my understanding. Uh, we'll have a chance to confirm that, I guess, uh, a little later this morning. Yes, sir. Uh, um, good. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, thank you very much. Let me ask Dr. Bremer, how would you characterize your relations with the city government, uh, both the executive and the council? Uh, in the time you've uh, been in operation. Are relations improving? Uh, do we need to do more in this area? We've talked about some legislative clarifications that may or may not have to occur depending on some things, but just wonder if you could give us an overall characterization. Um, you knew I was going to ask that, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> and I thought about what I would say and how I would say it. I'm going to ask the mayor the same thing. So. Yes, and, um, and, um, I, and I hope you would share that I would ask my colleagues, if you would permit me, Please. to allot a few minutes, Please. a minute, uh, part of my time, so they could share their sure. view, too. Um, um, this is a matter of, a, of um, great concern to me. You have spent a lot of time among ourselves talking about it and working with the mayor on it. Uh, I would say our relations with the mayor have been uh, episodic. Uh, they have been, um, from time to time, very good. Other times, um, uh, not so good. Um, that they're in basically questions of communications and interpretations of our authority and what we can do and should do. Um, in general, the mayor has been um, 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 supportive, supportive of, of um, our activities, uh, but as illustrated by the divergence of views about what should be the role of the CFO. Um, uh, we have had differences. Um, um, I thought our relations were improving um, uh, uh, substantially in the last few weeks. We had a weekend retreat, just board members and two of our senior staff and the mayor and his senior staff. Spent the whole day uh, working together, uh, covered a lot of ground, had a good exchange, constructive exchange of views, and I thought we were now witnessing a modification and an improvement. And then, um, unfortunately, um, uh, I must say, and this is my own concern, uh, I was troubled to see the mayor last uh, tonight um, uh, at the demonstration, um, uh, essentially um, 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 putting much of the blame for the um, financial restraints on the board and not putting them in perspective. So uh, that I did not find comfortable. Uh, but as I said, our relations are episodic. And, uh, but I think on balance, and I hope that they are improving. I would ask my colleagues whether they had any Dr. on this. Dr. Rimmel, let me just say one thing. The fact that they're going to be pointing the finger, the, well, that's why you're there. That's why it's worked in every city. It's called politics. Yes. 
yes. and in every other city when there have been uncomfortable cuts, yes. uh, the political leaders, uh, rather than stepping up to the plate many times, and have just uh, wanted to point the finger at somewhere else. So I just say get used to it. I'm just, uh, don't, I don't think this will be the last time. Thank and you. uh, you got a three-year term. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'll ask my colleagues if they wanted to share in this comment. I might add a three-year unpaid term, but uh, okay. <laughs> if I may, uh, I'd like to comment on the cooperation. I, I believe that it has uh, improved a lot, particularly since February 16th when the mayor uh, uh, unveiled the 1997 financial plan and budget. Uh, to me, that was quite a, uh, a shift in direction uh, and a very positive shift. And I think that, uh, at least as far as I'm concerned, and I believe the board, that the uh, recognize that shift and look forward to working in a, in a constructive fashion in developing vision and, and seeing that our common goals are, uh, in fact, uh, well understood and, and we're going in the, in the same direction. So. I'd like to speak on behalf of improved uh, cooperation and uh, in a substantive way. I'd like to speak also because I think that in the beginning, up until perhaps the early part of this year, there was a lot of conflict between the board and the mayor and his um, uh, staff. I believe, however, that once all of us came to understand that we none of us could succeed until we began better, better cooperation and to really put forth a, an image to the city residents that we were working together in their behalf that we began to see a lot of change. So I think that, that um, things have improved tremendously. It's not to say that politics won't continue to enter in <laughs> here and there, but that goes with the territory. I guess uh, I, I'm a cynic or maybe a realist. Uh, my expectations were at the outset that no one gives up power willingly and that we were going to have uh, some struggles at the outset about where the line was to be drawn and that that was expected. I think that uh, where we need to um, do some more work and I think our retreat started that process is in uh, communication. Uh, communication, uh, straight talk, about what are the issues and what are the roles and responsibilities. And I do believe that that has started. We have to respect what is the responsibility of an elected official, but the elected official has to also respect the responsibility of the control board, and we're not going to do it uh, unless we work together. And I'm much more optimistic now than I was, say, a month ago. Thank you very much. I, too, believe that there has been uh, significant improvement if you can uh, step back and forget the latest episodes that you're dealing with. Uh, the last month, I think, has been very good, uh, despite the most recent uh, things we've had to deal with, and I, I think they will get better over time. Thank you very much. I, I have a number of questions I will submit to you uh, that you can answer in writing, because so it's like 40 questions to go through, so I'm not going to get through all of these today. I do want to ask a more parochial question uh, from a Virginia perspective, and that is the public safety and corrections in the district. Uh, what are your plans and actions in this? I know that uh, Senator Hatch has proposed an anti-crime grant of $20 million uh, to the city. Um, Representative Heineman over on the House side is, uh, is actually looking to double that. We know that the money is badly needed. In addition to the additional funding that has been provided by the authority, uh, would, how do you feel about that, and what, what are the plans you've made for public safety in your markups of the budget? All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, a month or so ago, we agreed among ourselves that each board member would take the lead in the examination and assessment of uh, various uh, segments of the government, city government, and of the budget. With respect to public safety, our vice chairman, Steve Holland, uh, is the, took the lead on that. And uh, he has spent um, far more time than the rest of us, but we've all spent time on it, but he's spent far more time than the rest of us on public safety. And his, his recommendations are the ones that are embodied substantially in our um, recommendation vis-a-vis -vis the plan and budget, which we'll be sending to the mayor in the next couple of days. So I'm going to ask Mr. Holland to That'd respond to that, Mr. please. Okay. Public safety is... Public safety is of great concern to all of the citizens of the... Uh, of the district as well as the region, as you point out. 
Um, we believe that if you look at the crime statistics, they're up significantly in 1995 and the first part of 1996 over 1994. It's of great concern. Uh, the police department has had to do with uh, far too little in the way of uh, non-personal service spending. So uh, we would encourage in, uh, any assistance uh, from Senator Hatch or from any federal government form to help the police chief in, in getting on top of getting the uh, equipment that uh, he needs to run that operation. Uh, we have come up with uh, recommendations. We're suggesting that uh, uh, the police budget be increased uh, over what the mayor's 1997 uh, financial plan and budget mark will, will be uh, in, in this round. And uh, it's, it's, it's an area of concern that needs attention. We believe that uh, uh, the police chief is uh, probably doing a good job and we ought to give him the resources to do it and get out of his way and let him do it. What about the pay for the, uh, for the, uh, the men? The, I'm sorry? The pay for the men on the street. That's also been a subject of the Yes, the, the officers took a 4.2 percent uh, reduction. They're the lowest paid officers in the region. Uh, the officers are uh, uh, scheduled to have that pay reinstated October 1, as well as the premium pay on overtime October 1. Uh, we, uh, we believe that that should, should in fact take place. Uh, we're also recommending that a system of uh, uh, bonuses be explored to encourage police officers to do more and recognize when those, those successes are done. One of the things, just generally speaking on the budget, is we're trying to get to measuring outcomes as well as just resource inputs. Uh, that's throughout the budget, and that, I think, is an important shift in the way this is being approached. So that's true in police as well. In corrections, specifically Lorton, it's a disaster. Uh, corrections has been underfunded for the last 25 years every year. They've overspent their budgets because they've had to. They have nine court orders that are, are just, the courts are, are demanding uh, uh, greater spending. These are largely unbudgeted spendings, even though there are known spendings within the budget. Uh, the mayor in his 1997 uh, financial plan and budget mark indicated $18.8 .8 million worth of unbudgeted but known required spending. So we're almost $20 million underwater beginning there. Uh, there's another $47 million worth of uh, all right, included, in addition to that, there are other, other under, un budgeted items that could approach $50 million uh, on, on um, corrections. Lorton is in desperate need of long-term re-strategizing Lorton, and we need federal help here. Uh, there's been big problems of getting vendor payments, food, food to Lorton prisoners. Uh, there's a constitutional right, as you well know, with, in dealing with prisoners, the wards of the state, that has to be taken care of. Uh, all in all, uh, this is an area of extreme concern for uh, this control board, and we're looking at it that way. I understand, with, too, there are six full-time FBI agents. I'm sorry? Six full-time FBI agents assigned just to investigate crimes committed at the Lorton Complex. So it's costing federal resources that could be better used if we can find a better way to... Uh, Federal, uh, Lorton is poorly designed. You have high-risk prisoners living in dormitory style uh, with uh, very inadequate security. There are somewhere between three and four hundred security officers under court-mandated levels. Uh, it, it's, it's a disaster waiting to happen. Thank you very much. Um, let me just uh, ask one other question, then I want to get into a couple questions to individuals. Um, <coughs> The mayor's transformation plan. I think you spoke about it as we were looking through this. My first cut at that is that this is a remarkable turnaround from what from the rhetoric we've been hearing earlier. Uh, this is a plan that you are big scrubbing and we are starting to scrub up here in terms of what it means. But uh, this is really a good, solid uh, plan and a very good uh, start for the city. And we ought to be talking a little bit more about that as a starting place of where to go. And it, uh, it really, the mayor deserves some accolades on that. That, that was my take. As, do I understand the same thing from the control board? Yes, yes, Mr. Chairman. You're, you're, we share that view. We have just gone through a detailed evaluation of the overall plan and the transformation component of it as well. Um, um, and we will have in our report to the mayor praise for that effort. Um, we'll have some questions, but these will go more toward the a person of feasibility and possibility of implementation. 
but uh, it, it is a good plan, a remarkable plan, and it does represent uh, the kind of um, uh, product that can turn out when there's constructive, dedicated commitment to it. We Thank think you. it's a good plan. Thank you very much. Let me ask Dr. Ladner, uh, I know you're looking at the D.C. schools. I just wonder if you'd like to say a few words about what you're undertaking, the kind of the state of the schools, and, and I know you, it's going to take a long time to, to turn that around to, but any thoughts you might want to share with us, uh, at least on a preliminary basis at this yes. time? Yes, Mr. Chairman. In fact, we have had uh, numerous discussions with the superintendent and his top staff as well as school board members. We will soon, um, within the next two weeks, have a meeting of the full authority with the full school board. So our relationship is, is quite good. Um, we've also had discussions with various interest groups, parents, uh, and other supporters of the school system. The budget reflects um, um, a number of issues. Um, we have recommended that several schools be closed, um, and the system is going forward with that. We also feel very strongly that we need to begin to deal with outcomes in addition to inputs in the system. Some performance-based measures need to be undertaken. Um, there has been a disinvestment in the infrastructure of the schools. The schools in, in great need of, of um, a capital budget, so a capital budget needs to be funded. Um, and a capital plan needs to be developed for those schools that remain open. Um, there is a very serious question that the school system itself is grappling with, and we will join them in that issue. And that is the need for evaluation of teacher performance. Um, I don't want to get into all the nuances of that, but there has to be some way in which teachers' performance can be evaluated in terms of outcomes of, of the students so that it, some return on the investment can be realized by the citizens of the city. The management structure needs to be streamlined. Uh, we, I would like to just simply congratulate the superintendent on taking the lead and paring down his central office staff, but um, that has, work has to continue. There is not enough money in the budget for non-personal services. About 80 percent or so of that budget is for personal services, which means that we have uh, very large, uh, especially when we've done comparisons with area jurisdictions, uh, um, um, staff size and allocation per pupil, et cetera. What we find is that the, we're woefully lacking in being able to provide the schools enough money to do simple things like um, buy chalk and uh, construction materials, paper clips, et cetera. Um, so that, that the, um, and one final area I should mention is that we are concerned uh, uh, that non-district residents who work in the district or are bringing their children to the schools, placing them in the schools, for which the schools are not receiving any compensation or remuneration for tuition. We will take a very aggressive approach in assisting the school system as they've already begun, the process of identifying who those people are because the citizens of this city should not be subsidizing the education of non-residents. And it's a, it's a, my understanding of the numbers is about $9,000 a student that the city is spending. Is it, do you remember what that is? Not offhand? quite. It's, it's uh, 7000 and change. Okay, I've heard different numbers on that. Maybe you can get back into that. We have. We will put that in the record. It will also be in our report um, That'd be great. on the FY97 Well, we appreciate budget. what you're doing. I, I, thank you. Let me ask uh, Ms. Newman. I know you're going to, you did a number of things at the, um, at OPM. Uh, what kind of issues are you going to be exploring as you turn your attention to the city? Uh, let me start out by saying I think that we all will be successful in working with the city if, if we start out by a more positive discussion and attitude about the people who work for the city. It is very hard for people to work in an environment where they are being blasted day in and day out for things which, over which they do not have control. That does not mean that there are not You, you faced that with the federal employees. The I know, and, and that's why I'm making this yeah. comment, because I faced the same thing in, in a previous position. Uh, and so part of it is the tone, the way in which we deal with the workers. Now, that does not mean that changes don't have to take place. And I am working with Larry King, who has uh, put together a, a series of good proposals, and Harold Brazil, the chairman of government ops and representatives of the unions to look at ways in which the government needs to be restructured, some honest look at pay and bonuses and performance. I really do believe there ought to be more pay for performance and development of employees. And then we do need to develop a way of analyzing which functions ought to be performed by government 
and which ought to be performed by the private sector. And that's where there are going to be some difficult calls made, and we're going to have to rely on the good faith and the will of the people to bring about a system that provides the better service for, for the city. Uh, I do think there's some good people working on it. Uh, there are going to be some crunch calls made, and uh, we'll probably uh, be hearing more uh, from citizens who are looking at how it affects them individually rather than the larger picture. Thank you very much. And Mr. Singleton, let me just ask, you've got some tough ones. You've got Medicaid and child services, mental health, and that whole human service area. Do you want to just give us kind of some of the things you're looking at as we... Um, Mr. Chairman, it's, it's one of the most difficult areas, as you know. Uh, the city has probably, if not the highest, one of the highest percentages of, poverty, of people be below the poverty level in the, in the country. And because it also has a high per capita income, it only gets to 50 percent match uh, in Medicaid. And uh, Medicaid is one of, uh, it consumes about uh, $850, $900 uh, million dollars annually. And uh, the mayor has, and that's projected to grow uh, over the next four years to the point where it, the Department of Human Services now consumes about 34 percent of the budget. Uh, if the projections were correct along the baseline, that, that would go up to almost 40 percent. So it's clear that something has to be done there, and the mayor, in his plan, has recognized that as being a, an area that needs serious attention. Uh, the focus is being made to uh, do several things in Medicaid that should bring about significant changes over the four years of the plan. Uh, the authority and, uh, would encourage the uh, administration to also look at the non-Medicaid areas in terms of, uh, of reducing the spiraling cost uh, increases in that area, but I think the primary focus will be Medicaid over the next uh, uh, two or three years, and I think that will make a significant difference. Thank you. And that's really been where the money has really been going up, and the amount of revenues every year expended in that area. That's right. Take that out of the picture, the city's uh, much more stable financially. Yes. In terms of where the growth has been. Let me, uh, just one last question, Mr. Harlan, uh, because, uh, Steve, you've been active in assisting the city modernize its management systems and structures, and I know the control board has made some recommendations to set some money up, and I think one of the biggest problems the city has had is getting real-time information, honest numbers up on which to make decisions. It's hard to make good decisions if you don't have the, the data. Could you tell us where we are and then how long it's going to take to, to get some uh, decent systems up? Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, in the realignment of our responsibilities, because of a potential conflict of interest I might have in that area, uh, uh, because I used to be a partner in Pete Marwick, and Pete Marwick's in the business to do that, we decided that it would probably be the better part of good judgment that I did not get involved in that area. And so Ed Singletary, with his good control background and financial background, has taken the leadership in that. And I've taken on uh, public works, so if you have any questions about public <laughs> works. <laughs> I got a lot of, but I'm not, we'd be here all day. That, that'll be for another day. Uh, yeah, could you just give us a brief uh, a summary of wh where we expect to go and working with the city to bring that up? Because it looks like that's <coughs> just coming from Fairfax, where I headed the government there, which is, uh, I mean, the, the difference in the systems and the information available is night and day. That seems if, you, if the city could get some information systems up, they could start making some a little more intelligent decisions because you'd have more data available. Uh, that's correct. And also, good systems also lead to greater efficiency uh, in your workforce. Uh, I mean, we're doing a lot of things manually today that, that should be done with systems, and, and you can uh, reduce your uh, personnel cost. Uh, I think the city uh, recognizes that this is a serious problem, and they are uh, they're doing some uh, uh, planning work to completely change the uh, financial management system. Uh, the current FM FMS system was designed mainly as a funds management system. It's not a good budget control system. Uh, it's not a good uh, budget management system. It's not, it doesn't provide for good accounting. And uh, it's also designed on 1980s hardware and software. So there's clearly a serious need there. and. Uh, we hope that by the end of this fiscal year that uh, the, the preliminary work will be uh, 
done, it's currently underway, and that uh, they could have started to at least procuring a system that will bring about the kinds of efficiencies that are clearly needed in that area. Thank you very much. I'll now yield to the uh, representative from the, the City of Washington, Delegate Norton. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Bremer, members of the authority, uh, I want to once again, as I did in my statement, thank you for your service uh, under the worst conceivable conditions. It would have been difficult. It's difficult to be a financial authority in any case, uh, but instead of no pay, you perhaps deserve combat pay, uh, considering the conditions uh, essentially that have been set for you by the Congress. I also appreciate your willingness to work with the city to see if we can make this statute work. And I want to assure you uh, that uh, I think the obligation is not yours alone and that the city has to do much more and to engage in far less delay so that we are not pushed to the point where essentially the burden is put on me to try to save home rule from a bunch of members up here who say something isn't working. I mean, I cannot do that by myself, and I just want to make this public plea uh, that the city and the authority have to make this work. The authority is not a hammer to make it work. And if not, I am being put in a, a quite uh, untenable position uh, where uh, members and, and both sides march forward and say, well, I guess we have to change the law. So I, I just want to want to indicate that I very much appreciate the, what happened at the meeting that I had, and I knew, know that there have been several meetings before then, um, and I saw a real willingness, uh, particularly on the part of the mayor, to think creatively about ways to implement the statute. And could I say for the record, I think that there have developed hardened attitudes on both sides at the staff level. And I think that's because it's a very difficult task and there's not a sufficient mediating force in there when, when people try to do their job. Uh, and that, that that staff level tension needs to be broken down. And I think that we came, we came forward uh, in the meeting with some ways to do that, 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 that the more regular meetings, they've been setting up regular meetings, but they've been in such crisis management that they haven't been able to have them all, all, all the time. And so we have a, a circle of non-communication and, and the resulting uh, hostility sometimes that's, that, that develops and people don't communicate. Uh, and again, I want to reiterate my own willingness to work with um, the city and with the authority to do whatever I can to be helpful to you. You've had a much harder road to hoe than you should have. But I must say, most of that harder road to hoe has really not come because of your view of the cuts that should be made or the city's view of what it should be done. Not this year. Could it, that could be a problem, but not this year. Um, if you look at the city's financial situation, uh, what I think people wanted to see this year was the movement towards some downsizing and maybe some um, some movement toward, uh, and everybody knew it was the first year, I mean, you just got there almost, some movement toward dealing with uh, one or another part of, of the uh, operations of the district. And I think Dr. Bremer in his first statement talked about low-hanging fruit. Instead of having the opportunity to look for low-hanging fruit, Congress <laughs> made sure that uh, the authority would be involved in day-to-day -day crisis and cash management. Even, and the residents of the district seem to think that the problem comes from the authority. Well, let me just say here for the record, Congress did it to you. Congress did it to, DC, to UDC. <coughs> Congress did it to snow renew removal. Congress did it for our not being able to get recycling, but every other week. And this is how Congress did it. The authority said to the Congress, give us the chance 
to put a plan in operation before proceeding to any more cuts. It didn't wimp away from cuts, but it said we need to get a plan in place so we cut intelligently. And what the Congress said was we don't want to hear that authority. Go ahead and cut wherever you have to cut. Cut blind. That was not an authority decision. That was, frankly, a House decision. And when I say Congress, I ought to make it clear who did it, who the villain in the piece is. It's the body in which I sit. Because the, the, the Senate said, hey, the authority is our agent. The authority says they need time to put a plan in place working with the district before further cuts. Why have them there unless you do what they say do? Uh, you are spending, the district is spending at an absolutely crippling level, 4.8, uh, which is below the level it spent at last year, not even at the reduced level uh, that Congress gives you with the cuts. And therefore, I have, uh, let me just put the real question that, I, that is on my mind, because I like to think ahead. Um, Congress says that the district should have a balanced budget in four years. I realize that you have not done a detailed analysis of how the city will look four years down the road. But looking at the status quo, do you believe that the city can have a balanced budget in, within four years if nothing else changes? Um, Madam Congresswoman, um, we do have a forecast made by the mayor for the next four years. Um, um, assuming that there are no changes in laws and with the um, um, outlook for revenue, um, that budget shows a deficit in, in uh, 1997, 1998, and it shows surpluses in the following two years. Um, at this juncture, um, given the work we have done in reviewing the revenue assumptions, it looks as though the, um, the, um, the outlook for revenue um, um, seems soundly based. Um, the um, other side is the uh, expenditure side. And there, there, that budget, as you can see in the mayor's um, 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 plan, visualizes increases in spending. Um, so whether the, the balanced budget can um, prevail or not depends on a slowdown in the rate of growth in spending. Um, um, so um, if the plan is fulfilled, and as I said earlier, uh, some of the questions we have, certainly some of the questions I have, concern the, um, um, the implementation of the plan and, the, and whether the presumed savings visualized in the plan can in fact be achieved. So I think there is a, a um, real uh, possibility uh, that there will be a, a balanced budget in four years. How do I weigh the probability? I would say the probability is um, um, above 50-50 and um, um, considerably higher than 50-50. But in my judgment, unless there is some increase in revenue from some source, um, the um, chance of getting that balanced budget will be very, very um, um, slim. Um, um, one thing has convinced me is that um, the city cannot, cannot cut its way to a balanced budget. There has to be some, uh, certainly reductions in spending would have to contribute, but um, uh, there would also need to be some increase in revenue, either from uh, sources um, under the district's own control or uh, the federal payment. And um, you should anticipate that as we look at um, um, revenue uh, in the months ahead, as we will be doing, uh, we will have to take a good, hard look at the federal payment and federal contribution as well. There are other certain 
episodic requirements that will be there. One is um, um, the um, pension obligation liabilities. Um, um, here, based on the work we've done so far, I'm convinced that um, the resolution of that problem uh, will have to depend substantially on the federal payment. And there are some other areas, um, um, and we'll be coming before this committee um, in the near future to talk about funding and, the, and, the, and so on. And one of the issues we will be raising is the question of funding the uh, embedded debt that has accumulated over the years. So um, yes, Madam uh, Congresswoman, I believe there is a, a good prospect that there will be a balanced budget. The city will achieve a balanced budget, but there are certain conditions that will have to be met to make it a reality. And among them, a revenue source and, and, and uh, of course, as you say, that the assumptions hold up. Uh, the, mayor's, the mayor is to be uh, complimented on his plan. Um, and I think he's to be complimented on the way in which, in, on the interaction between his staff and the plan and, and the way in which information is coming out. For example, his, uh, um, his staff who works on Medicaid believes that uh, apparently the savings there may not be able to be made. And I note many, many opportunities for, for uh, revision. I'm concerned that uh, revenue, at least on my best information, is that revenue this year is down $100 million. I mean, I'm not sure that could have been anticipated. Uh, and I begin to wonder if we are not going to see more of the same. This year has uh, had the effect of frightening many people out of the district. And um, we know from the statistics most recently received that we have begun to hemorrhage taxpayers. And I wonder, for example, if the revenue assumptions assume we'll have the same number of taxpayers, because if they do, then I think we're going to have to do something to make sure we have the same number of taxpayers. I'm, I'm working on a, on a tax discount bill that I, th that I hope will, will help in this. But of course, that is over the long run, too. And I want to endorse your notion that we need to think about uh, revenue uh, and think carefully. Um, the pension plan we're working on, uh, if the Congress accepts it, uh, would mean an immediate windfall of money that would be spent, could be spent on services. Uh, but all of that will take careful work, and you will be central. The authority will be central to that work. I would like to, to ask for clarification, uh, Dr. Bremer, on, on uh, a sentence or word, words from your testimony that, that the district will, that there will be a need for additional short-term resources. We know about long-term resources, but additional short-term resources. Were you talking about the, the loan, the bridge loan then, or were you talking about something else when you say short-term resources? Um, um, Mr. Norton, short term means um, the current fiscal year. Um, uh, specifically, um, as I look, as we've been looking at the cash forecast, um, uh, if the city gets the uh, federal payment of the remaining $220 million sometime this fiscal year, um, the city will end up um, with a deficit, a cash fall, uh, beginning um, um, in April, beginning in April. Um, that's e even if it gets the, um, the federal payment. Uh, the um, um, forecast we have in hand, and uh, this was prepared by the um, uh, chief financial officer, uh, but we have looked at it, and our staff has scrubbed it and agree that this is a reasonable, um, uh, acceptable forecast. Uh, by April, there will the receipts mining disbursements will be negative by $69 million. May, $23 million. Uh, June, $81 million. And come July, $146 million. Um, 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 in August, that's $60 million. And only in September, uh, when uh, tax receipts come in and so on, um, uh, would there be a surplus of 120? But looking through the rest of the year, and this in terms of cash, um, 
uh, this forecast visualizes that $194 million, almost $200 million short. So somewhere between, uh, say, the end of March, certainly uh, by the end of April, looking on out through the rest of the fiscal year, the city will have a severe cash shortage. Um, you know, uh, I believe that the only way to obtain uh, funding to cover that shortage, um, um, aside from postponing payments to vendors and everybody else, um, uh, is to um, um, borrow from the Treasury. And, is uh, what I'm sorry? Borrow from the Treasury. Since the city has no access to external capital markets, uh, the Treasury is the only potential source. That's what I had in mind. Now, um, and as I said earlier, looking down the road and the long-term issue, we'll have to come back to that one. Thank you. I note uh, in looking at uh, the other cities that have had authorities that they contracted out a lot of their work. For example, on when, when um, contract time comes up, you're going to have labor um, Contracts. They con in New York, they, uh, in Cleveland, they contracted that out to labor management specialists and law firms who were specialized in that. Uh, given the need to overhaul the district's operations, uh, I, I would like to have, uh, I'd like to know what the makeup of the staff of the authority is. What, who are these people? What, what, what are their functions? How many are there? Who are they? Moreover, the committee asked for resumes of, of the staff, and they have not been received. And I wonder why they have not been received. Um, uh, Mrs. Norton, the uh, first question, the makeup of the staff. Um, um, we do have a, a table of organization. I will characterize them uh, quickly. Um, we have about, on, we have on board about between 25 and 30 people now, around 27, 28. Um, the chief of staff, of course, is um, John Hill. Um, um, the deputy, um, a senior staff member, is um, 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 Mark Goldstein. What is his? What is his? Uh, what is his specialty? Um, um, may I do this? Um, because I want to provide you with as much accurate information as can on the spot. So would it be uh, possible for me to ask Mr. Hill, who is here with us, to provide this description? Uh, um, we know the people, know who they, they are, but I think it would be better if you got a description uh, from um, uh, Mr. Hill, who is um, the chief of staff in this sense, um, and he knows all about the uh, individual specialties and exactly what each one is doing and how each one fits in. Mr. Hill can also respond to the question about the, the resume. So with your permission, Mr. Chairman, would I, may I bring Mr. Hill to the table? Well, if, um, I, the, the chairman said we, refer to see the, we, we prefer to see the resumes. If the resumes had been provided as the staff, as the staff indicated the committee needed, then of course I wouldn't have had to ask the question at all. In, in deference to uh, the fact that we've got to get out of this room within an hour, it would be quite all right with me, Mr. Chairman, if the resumes of the staff were provided to the committee forthwith. We will put them in the record, please. Appreciate that. Okay. Finally, and let I, me... I would do also, we would include a table of organization uh, describing the assignment for each person. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. One more question. Uh, when you when when you sit down with the mayor, and I know this is going to be an, an exhausting and but productive exercise, and that all kinds of changes uh, and, and the rest will be made, uh, do you contemplate setting out goals for operational reform on a yearly basis? Part of the problem this year, of course, is that you've had to manage cash and just manage what Congress has, has indicated you had to do to make cuts and, and you had to manage with a delayed federal payment. As a result, for the fiscal year, for this fiscal year, it will be difficult, it would be difficult for the city and the authority to be able to say that something that residents can see and feel uh, has happened. 
uh, do you contemplate um, setting out goals by year so that, for example, in 1996, uh, the goal for fixing, helping the city fix parts of the police department or parts of Medicaid will be X and, and residents will be able to see X. Uh, by the way, I ask about this goal year by year approach because I think it is preferable to a more impressionistic approach as to whether or not people or residents feel that something has changed. That often is, is so subjective. But if residents are told that um, there is, uh, there, that uh, shall I get very mundane now, that, that there will be, uh, that half of the police cars will be on the street, it will so <laughs> increase confidence that even though people may not feel that, I think they will feel better about the city. So my question really has to do with goals that are specifically set out on a year-by-year -year basis having to do with service improvement uh, so that residents have a way of knowing whether the city working with the authority has met its own goals. This is not um, the way you formulated um, um, shows grit is imaginative and um, um, I am intrigued by it. But um, uh, actually, uh, we have not done that. Um, as you properly described, um, our activities so far have been quite episodic. Uh, we have been consumed and taxed to deal with the issues, that, some of which mandated by Congress, some which have come up naturally. Uh, but um, I'm intrigued with the notion. I will give it a great deal of thought. Uh, but as of now, we have not done that. I would imagine that um, we, after consideration, we will uh, conclude that um, some kind of effort at what I would describe as strategic planning of our own activities uh, would be highly desirable. And I'll, I'm, I can assure you that um, we will devote as much time and um, thought to the matter as, as we can find. Thank you. thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. May I thank uh, the members of the authority again and thank you for your indulgence. And thank you very much. Uh, let me just ask one very brief question. We, there have been talks about splitting up the city's payment for the remainder of the year into some amount this month and maybe some the next month. What does that do to the cash uh, flow? Um, it, it would um, um, certainly having $100 million more is helpful. But Mr. Mr. Chairman, the process, as much as the amount of cash, is, is what is troublesome. Um, um, such episodic piecemeal payment uh, makes it impossible to plan and to uh, schedule. And um, so um, uh, it wouldn't be counterproductive, but it certainly would not be very productive. So I would hope that the um, Congress would see fit to appropriate the remaining uh, amount so we'll know we have it in hand, we can plan, and, and, and not uh, disrupt the process any longer. Thank you, very, thank you very much. Thank all of you for what you're doing for the city. We're going to call. I'm going to go out of order uh, if there's uh, no objection and call now the mayor and the uh, chairman of the council. And then we'll hear from the IG and the CFO. Um, I'd like to call. Uh, Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor and Chairman Clark. Uh, our next panel, you know, as you know, it's the policy of this committee that all witnesses have to be sworn before they uh, testify. I wonder if you'd rise with me. I'll raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give this subcommittee to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, sir. We have Mr. Black here, the district budget uh, council person, with uh, Mr. Yes. Clark. I appreciate you Look, taking up. You can Mr. be seated. Um, just let me make a couple observations. I want to move uh, through as quickly as we can. Um, all of you will deal, who, both of you gentlemen deal most directly as elected public officials with issues that we're discussing today and in our hearing next week. And I want to commend you, Mr. Mayor, for the positive steps that you've uh, taken recently. 
uh, your transformation budget and your multi-year plan as a realistic response to the economic crisis we face in the nation's capital. You have also recently taken some additional and necessary steps to move toward a balanced budget. Uh, this is a welcome departure from former times and it makes me optimistic and I think you heard from the control board. It makes them optimistic that we can continue to work together as part of this, the team on a broad range of common concerns. Mr. Clark, the Council has appeared to have had a difficult time dealing with the extraordinary multiple crises currently besetting the district. I detect a willingness on the part of most of the Council to deal with the problems that confront you, but a lack of information, solid ideas and perhaps consultation by both the City Executive and the Control Board seem to have kept caused the Council unity to suffer. <coughs> I hope that this situation is being dealt with and I look forward to hearing uh, your opinions uh, today. Go ahead, Mr. Mayor. Good morning, good morning, Chairman Davis, and uh, to our on Congresswoman Ms. Norton. Uh, let me uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify on the implementation of Public Law 104-8, the District of Columbia Financial Responsibility and Management Assistance Act of 1995. Chairman, uh, before I get into uh, my uh, analysis of, of the act and, and all the implementation of it. Uh, because of inaction by the Congress, because of the lack of a budget, uh, here it is, uh, March 19, 1996. The finances of the District of Columbia are worse today than they were this time last year. I repeat that, because of the inaction of the Congress in passing the city's budget, which would deny us almost 220 some million dollars of federal payment, which ordinarily comes in the fall. Our finances are worse today than where you, you go. You get no argument As of here. yesterday, uh, the city government owed uh, hospital providers and nursing homes and other Medicaid providers 230-odd million dollars. That's not right for these business people these health care providers to be carrying this debt on their backs and almost some $80 million in other vendor payments uh, business people have not been paid. So I, I know we're going to have a hearing on finances next week, but I think the city ought to know, the citizens ought to know, that if this act was designed to stabilize our finances and move us to a much more stable, predictable situation for the future, if this Act, this kind of activity continues for the 97 budget, a 98 budget. Uh, this act would have been uh, uh, subject to forces that weren't anticipated at the time. Also, Mr. Chairman, as you know, when uh, let me let me let me thank you for the time and attention you paid to the district. I know when you ran for office in Northern Virginia, you had no idea that you would also be working as hard as you do for the citizens of the district, and I certainly want to thank you for that. And I hope your constituents understand that it's all good work for the cause of uh, America's first city and our nation's capital. Chairman, in terms of the act, as you know, uh, initially, uh, when the idea of the uh, act came up, I was not for a control board. I recognized that um, the other cities around the country that had worse problems than we but uh, after the dialogue started uh, moving, it was clear to me that Congress needed an entity in order to assure itself that it had something between itself uh, and the city government uh, to feel some comfort in us going to the U.S. Treasury. That was a political act. I understand that. And uh, I worked as hard as I could to at least point out some of the, the uh, difficulties that may be there and also some of the good things. Let me say that there's a built-in conflict, and I just point to uh, a couple of them. I don't think any uh, chief executive in the country, whether it's in the private sector or in the public sector, uh, has um, no absolute control over budget preparation. In this act, the budget preparation is vested uh, in the CFO and in the budget office, which comes under the uh, CFO. Uh, I think it's appropriate what Congress was concerned about and what I was concerned about and citizens was that the city uh, credibility was on the line in terms of revenue estimating and budget execution, budgets being overspent. And those are the areas, it seems to me, that looking in retrospect uh, should have been the major focus of the act 
and which I certainly support, but budget preparation uh, is a critical need. I'm not suggesting any changes in this act, but I'm just pointing out if we were to change it, we need to give the mayor budget preparation because uh, under this act, theoretically, it hasn't happened quite this way. The, the CFO uh, could refuse to, to supply the mayor with the budget information and in a format uh, that the mayor wants. Uh, Mr. Williams and I have been working on that situation or the budget uh, uh, information could not be given to me on a timely basis. I could want it on Tuesday and the CFO theoretically say, well, I'm not ready to give it to you on Tuesday. So as we look at that future, uh, if we ever make any changes, certainly the budget preparation process ought to uh, be under the absolute control of the mayor. Secondly, uh, nowhere in, in public government that I've been able to find, Chairman, do you have a CFO uh, that's torn between the mayor and some other entity, uh, which means that Mr. Williams or whoever is CFO, if I indicate I want this done this way and, and the control board indicates it want done that way, he, you know, he's torn in the middle. Uh, and I know that that was a political necessity to, to move towards what people call I think to the extreme, an independent CFO. Independence, it seems to me, is one where the numbers are verified by the CFO and the mayor and no one else can, can then uh, tamper with them, or the budget execution is the main part of this to make sure that the controller function uh, is, is there. Then that's a real, real conflict. And uh, so I thought I would point it out. Also, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, in terms of the act itself, I'm the first to say that the control board and the city government got off to a rocket start. And I think part of that has to do with the tone set by certain members of Congress. There were certain members of Congress, does not include you, uh, who gave the impression that this control board was to be a super cop, one of punishment, and one of, uh, of uh, hammering across the head to get something done. Uh, Congressman Walsh from time to time says the control board is not tough enough. What does that mean, tough enough? And so that tone has begun to change somewhat. But when that tone comes from the leadership of the appropriations process, the control board, I'm sure, has to be sensitive to what that means. And that's why I think initially uh, the uh, board and, and the uh, mayor and sometimes the council got off to a uh, a ro rocky start. Uh, that has changed significantly in the sense that we meet more now, we, we talk more, uh, we're less confrontational. Uh, this process, Mr. Chairman and Ms. Norton, as you all know, won't work unless there's complete cooperation and trust between the various parties. It can't be a big I and a little you. It has to be that we have roles and responsibilities to play and that the control board can only succeed if the executive succeeds and the council succeeds. And so we come with that understanding now that we have to work closer together. There'll be some political differences, there'll be some program differences, but it's how you began to solve that. And back to 1995, when this act was uh, created, uh, we were all uh, traumatized by the size of this deficit, $335 million for 94. Uh, and we moved to try to figure out how this act could assist us in that regard. Another observation about the act is that in other jurisdictions where you've had control boards or some variations of these kind of boards, there's always been a provision for retiring the deficit to get you jump-started in that regard. There were no provisions in this act to jump-start the deficit. It should have been. We should have tackled that uh, last summer on getting the $335 million out of the way. That way we could focus our time and attention on system design, on improving our systems, of uh, balancing our budgets, of making the uh, very difficult decisions as it relates to uh, budget cuts. But most of the time, and Mr. Williams would tell you when he testifies, and certainly Mr. Rogers, and, and I know that we spend 15 to 20 percent of our time, probably every day, 
on tracking down vouchers, talking to business people about why didn't I gotten paid, uh, trying to uh, get somebody not to cut the heat off or, or cut the water off or, or close the police uh, rental place. If we had financed this deficit early on, we wouldn't be doing this, Mr. Chairman. Our time could be better spent on trying to better manage it the government now. We've been talking with the control board and members of Congress about how we can finance this deficit. There were some members of the Congress, unfairly so and, and without, without the reality, thought you could cut your way out of, the, out of this deficit. You couldn't do that. We'll talk more about that next week. And so that's hampered us in our ability to focus on the other 11 or 12 areas of the act in terms of structural reform, management reforms, and et cetera. But in spite of all that, uh, we were able to, uh, to, to move ahead uh, in this area. Uh, and I noticed that Dr. Bremer early on had said uh, that the board didn't understand, well, wasn't, wasn't aware of the complete nature, uh, severe to the problem. That's unfortunate because uh, in February of 1995, we laid out uh, the problem and the crisis. I called attention to the revenue implications of the 94 audit. We gave wide attention to the McKenzie Report, which outlined in great detail our revenue and management predicament. Also, we charted a course for the remainder of FY95, which promised to reverse the spending a trend, uh, applied stringent spending controls, and began the process of change management. Uh, we've worked hard to keep these promises. Uh, also, uh, Mr. Chairman, and you, you talked a little bit about this in your opening statement, and others talked about it. It's only natural for participants and observers in the process to focus on instant results, short-term issues, and daily debates. Uh, these were far more visible than the ongoing work towards long-range change and achievement. Uh, thus, a series of controversies hovered over the adjustment process, often appearing more significant than they really were. Uh, there was a perception, for instance, that the presence of the control board was met with hostility uh, and lack of cooperation on the part of the Barrett administration. That's not true. Uh, I said early on, once it was clear we were going to have a uh, financial management system authority, uh, I would be extremely cooperative with the urge and demand all of the employees under my control to be cooperative. Uh, cooperation does not mean, though, that you don't disagree on a, on a program priority. If someone says to me, that we're going to recommend you close, eliminate the Office of Asian, that's a program difference. I'm going to say, no, I'm not going to agree to that. So disagreeing on a program priority or disagreeing on a, uh, on a uh, philosophical point about whether or not you fund this program or this program, that's not lack of cooperation. That is a matter that you have to take into consideration. Uh, I view myself as having been elected by the people of Washington and part of my responsibility is to reflect their values and their views and to reflect their priorities uh, and, and, the, and, the, and the budget process. And so we've done that. We've been very cooperative. Let me, uh, let me speak a little bit about the CFO. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about the independence of the CFO. I've talked a little bit about that. This is more structured than, than personal. Uh, the act was carefully balanced politically. Ms. Norton knows, and Mr. Davis, you know that. There was some <coughs> divergent points of view about the CFO. Uh, it's very difficult for any mayor to operate without having some control over the CFO and the budget process. In fact, the Congress recognizes that with his own self. You have the Congressional Budget Office, which assists the Congress in information gathering and sharing, uh, as well as looking at what OMB and the President sends over to you. And so I was interested in trying to make sure uh, that the CFO uh, was more aligned to the executive branch of government than the control board. There were others who wanted the CFO not to have anything to do with the mayor in terms of any institutional alignment and wanted complete control of the CFO by the control board. As you know, we struck a political balance uh, where I nominate the uh, CFO and it's confirmed by the, uh, by the board. But it ought to be clear that the attitude ought to be that the CFO 
<coughs> as equal responsibility to the mayor. In fact, more responsibility to the mayor in budget preparation than to the board. And we're working to try to clear that up. Then there was questions about the budget office. As you know, before this act, I had the authority, the mayor had the authority to appoint a budget officer, budget director with the consent uh, of the council, and same is true of finance revenue. To us, to Ms. Norton and myself, those were basic home rule issues. Those were basic home rule issues. They might have been awkward in how you do it, but they were basic home rule issues. You take from the local government the power of the budget officer and the officer and the power of the finance and revenue officer. Also in these areas, there are a half a dozen or so uh, executive, I mean, accepted appointments which deal with the mayor having the authority to appoint people and they serve at his or her pleasure. Uh, we've worked this out in the sense that I'm prepared to <coughs> delegate to the CFO in consultation with me the, uh, the uh, appointment of the budget director and the director of finance and revenue. And also I'm prepared in consultation with me to uh, uh, give the CFO the authority to remove uh, those persons if they're not performing well. The way I manage, I don't want any uh, deputies or people below the head of the department to be forced to work with somebody or where they, 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 the, uh, either the person is incapable or incompetent or they're incompatible. And so it seems to me that will be worked out and uh, there's no need for us to continue to say let's strengthen the, the, the power of the CFO and let's take these uh, authorities uh, from the mayor. Again, that kind of tone and that kind of climate does not invite cooperation. It invites conflict. And I would hope that those who would say that would stop talking in that manner and talking in a manner of how can we make this worship work more effectively, which is a different kind of tone than taking some from the mayor or giving it over here. And as an elected official, Mr. Davis and Ms. Norton, you know we have a responsibility to our constituency and we don't want to feel as though we don't have any authority to make budget decisions and make priorities. And so I hope that after this hearing, that tone would change and by taking here, but that we're trying to more effectively make this act work. Because it was, fact, it was, it was fashion at a time we didn't know uh, enough about all the implementation parts of it. We now know how it works and does not work. Also, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm delighted that to hear you and others comment on our transformation plan. Uh, we are serious about transforming Washington making America's first city competitive, uh, make, make our city competitive with the region, with uh, the nation, and to make our government competitive, to make it a government that's well-disciplined, well-managed, smaller, customer-friendly, uh, business-friendly, do it right the first time, dependable what kind of government. Uh, and that's what's important to us. We want this government to be the very best that we we know. Also, Mr. Chairman, part of the transformation, if you, as you look at it, uh, was based on the reality that people throughout America really do care what happens here. Uh, there's a national constituency for a first-class capital city. People outside this city and this region want to believe that Washington, D.C. is a reflection of America's highest values and a place of opportunity for America's brightest goals. Uh, we need everyone's help and support in that regard. And this act, uh, with some internal adjustments, can be of assistance. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, and I've said this to the control board, I was and I'm still concerned that we ought to get on with the broader work of this act. I think we've spent uh, too much time, in my view, uh, reviewing contracts as an example. That's not solving the structural problems of the government we ought to be looking at the relationship between the federal government and the district government with corrections, with Medicaid, with pensions, and also with the financial management system. Uh, our financial management system uh, is the same today it was this time last year. Uh, that should have been an emphasis of the, uh, the uh, board. Uh, our Procurement Act, which I pointed out last year, is antiquated, needed some major transformation. We want to do that the board should have been more of an assistance to us 
and working on those big ticket items. And I think we began to do that. I think we've been talking about this at our retreat, what ought to be the focus of the board. The other thing I think which has begun to change, there was a tone set earlier on by members of the Congress and, and, and by just in, in general that the board was supposed to tell us how the train got wrecked after the train ran off the track. Uh, that's not the role of this board. This board ought to be in a locomotive, uh, in the cab with me and with the council, driving this locomotive, helping to steer it as opposed to saying, here's what happened after it wrecked. And, but I think we began now to get a tone where we're all working together to steer the locomotive as opposed to trying to beat us across the head about what we didn't do. Uh, I'm optimistic that in spite of these difficulties, in spite of the fact we don't have a budget, uh, and that, that's, that is really a something in America, not to have a budget, that we still are making a lot of progress in making the city uh, more functional and making services more dependable and in resolving some of the structural problems which confront us. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, let me just say, uh, I think that we agree with you in terms of the city's budget situation, that the Congress has been part of the problem. If it's any consolation, half the federal government's agencies aren't funded either and don't have a budget this year. But in this case, you've needed the cash flow and the payment, uh, and it's, uh, we, we've, got to, we've got to do better. This is just unacceptable. Thank you. Mr. Clark. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman and the members of uh, your subcommittee. Uh, I'm pleased to be here on behalf of the Council of the District Columbia. I know a couple of my members are here. I see Council Member Hill, uh, Hill, uh, Charlene Jarvis, and I see Council Member Frank Smith. I'm joined at the table by the our, uh, and Council Member Mason is here too. I'm joined at the table by the Director of Budget and Finance of, of the City Council, and we're glad to present this testimony. Uh, you asked us to comment upon the work of the Control Board. And I, let me start by saying we're very pleased that they're there. Uh, we had some question as to whether we needed one. Uh, some people have said I opposed having one. I did not. I waited to determine whether we did need one. And uh, I came to that conclusion, and so did the council. We're particularly pleased, and I say this particularly to Congresswoman Norton, because she stood for this point, that they're, all the board members are Washingtonians. That's very helpful because there is a sense of community amongst us, albeit with different issues and different roles and some constructive tension put between us. They are Washingtonians and part of our community. We view them that way and they view us that way. And I think that's extremely important uh, in our life. And it's helped quite a lot as we've tried to grow uh, together. Um, the um, council has been very proactive in seeking communication. Uh, we have repeatedly asked to meet with the board from the day that the president appointed the five members. I remember calling up uh, the members one by one uh, and uh, uh, saying that I'd like to meet with them right away. It was determined by Chairman Bremer and myself that uh, we should do that first chairman to chairman and then members to members and then staff to staff. Uh, but that began its process and it has gone some distance since then. We found some problems in communication particularly with uh, uh, the inquiries uh, from us and the responses uh, to the board and back and forth. Uh, notice of hearings has been a problem. Uh, when the board is gonna hold the hearing, sometimes we don't know it. Uh, 24 hours before then, um, the, uh, that has resolved itself to some extent. And there's been a particular problem uh, with respect to the standards of measures by which we were gonna be measured. But particularly, I'll give you a couple examples in the question of how contracting out be, would be credited for FTE reductions. Uh, there was a charge to us that we ultimately met to reduce the FTEs by a certain level, and we did that. But when we provided for contracting out how, for each contract, how many FTEs would be credited. We worked that out too. But the point is we had problems and we worked them out. And there's been a recent problem, for instance, uh, with respect to uh, 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 something called double counting. When in a gross budget, when one dollar is counted twice coming down as the revenue going over to another agency and then spent out again, it's uh, double counting. And there's been a problem there. And we're trying to work that out. But I'll talk about that a little bit more. One problem that has existed with communication is it's not been very tripartite. The council has pushed both the executive and the, the board uh, seriously and repeatedly. Uh, to have triple level, tri level uh, communication between the mayor, the council, and the board. Uh, and when we've had those kind of meetings, either at the principal's level of the board members, mayor, and city council, or at the staff level, 
uh, through something called the uh, uh, interagency of Mexico, inter initiative. initiative implementing committee, excuse me, uh, uh, in the budget structure group, uh, there has been great improvement. So uh, you did say in your statements, uh, Mr. Davis, that you thought maybe the council was uh, a little bit out of this, but uh, out of the communication, but we've been proactive with respect to it. I just want to put that on the record. Uh, I, I hope uh, you might know that. I'm sure a Congressman uh, Norton knows it. The council has very aggressively sought uh, communication with our teammates in this effort. Um, we, uh, uh, I, we have some concerns regarding matters that uh, uh, where we need to see some some less things from the board. We'd like to see some less things from the board. In some places, particularly, where we want to see s some more things from the board. With respect to the review of legislation, we're concerned about an apparent, but not yet uh, uh, really manifested, uh, desire by the board to get far beyond financial issues. Let me just give you an example. It didn't come to reality, but there was a legislation passed by the city council to change the structure of the board that reviews tax assessments. And there was uh, inquiry made from us to us by the board staff asking about uh, whether that would not give the mayor more discretion in appointing people to that board. We didn't get any indication that there was any financial implications to it, just that there might be too much discretion uh, in the mayor with respect to that. <coughs> And there was, uh, the, we were told, they were consideration of proposing to the board that they reject that. But we changed the legislation to address that concern, if you will, but it had nothing to do, really, with the financial affairs. Uh, and there's a question as to the scope of the review. We've had some discussions with the uh, board regarding that and understood some of the actual factual background around which that came down. But there was that concern, and I do, do think that it needs to be noted. We have a particular concern with some of the things the board recently did in its action on our fiscal year 96 uh, um, uh, budget uh, when it uh, uh, took some courses that seemed to reflect policy and again not financial wisdom. Um, they suggested, for instance, that we increase the budget for ANCs, advisory neighborhood commissions. Now we had bit the bullet and cut the budget for the ANCs and the board uh, the guardian of our financial affairs uh, took it upon itself to uh, increase the ANCs. And that, that, that irked us a little bit. And secondly, uh, we took a very hard decision, a very hard decision, to say that the program for um, summer employment of our youth should be restricted on a means test to young people from families under the poverty line uh, and not available to all persons, middle class and probably even upper class as well. And we took that position, the mayor vetoes, we overrode the, uh, went back up. And the mayor, uh, the board decided to determine in the mayor's side of that issue. Again, causing an increase in financial costs. We had some considerable con well, concerns with that, thinking that it was policy and not financial uh, 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 austerity that was driving the board. But we have had the opportunity to, to talk with them and to talk with the board about these concerns, and, and especially that weekend conference that the, the uh, president, uh, uh, Chairman Bremer, mentioned when he talked here, uh, uh, he, uh, he did, we have moved forward. Now, we, uh, we, uh, we do want some things less, but even more things we want more of from the board. Now, you may not believe it, but the council wants to see some more things from the board. We want to see more contract review. I think I disagree with the mayor. Uh, we look for the board to do some good contract review. We're concerned about uh, contracts as being a place where money is being spent and decisions are being made, and we don't always get the, 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 in touch with it except those which go over $1 million for the course of more than a year. So we look for a more contract review by the board, and we, we encourage that. We encourage more management uh, analysis and recommendations uh, with respect to how to improve management coming from the board, particularly in two areas of procurement and personnel, which are central uh, both to the budgetary um, structure of the city, financial affairs of the city, and the operations of the city. We would like to see uh, the board more involved with that. 
we particularly want to see something that was just touched upon lightly, and that's the question of revenues. It never seems to be gotten to because it's a very difficult issue to deal with. We're trying to face that issue with respect to our own revenues that we generate in the District of Columbia. And of course, in that question, you usually come to the question of taxes. But we're not necessarily looking to place out more taxes right now because we already have a load of them uh, in Washington, D.C., so much so that they're non we're non-competitive with other jurisdictions, Mr. Davis, and, and bringing, a, uh, bringing a income and business to the District of Columbia. We, we want to become competitive in that area. So we have, we're in the process of putting into place a tax revision commission. Uh, um, and the, the second vote on that legislation is coming on April 2nd. And we hope to get that appointed and have the mayor appoint some persons to that to look at our tax structure over the course, which we haven't done over the course of the last 20 years, and make recommendations not to raise more taxes necessarily, though that might be a mention of that, but to see how the taxes can be re reorganized and structured so as to produce revenue for the operation of the city and a tax base uh, which will be more attractive. The board has been given that information. We'd like to see the board involved in, in responding to it. They, ha they have been asked for a response to the Tax Revision Commission structure itself, um, and we ask as we go along for them to look at the, what comes forward from that commission. Um, the uh, uh, um, uh, other issues regarding revenues uh, get to uh, a related issue, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, and that is independence. And I guess I'm going to get a little, a little bit um, touchy, I guess, with respect to this, because we're talking about independence from you. And we're talking about the independence from the Congress. We're talking about that part of the FIRMA law which charged the board, charged the board not only to advise the council, but to advise the Congress with respect to matters of the fiscal integrity of the city. That means, in the case of revenue, some serious questions. It means the financial responsibilities for the region, of the region, for the operation of the Corps. You can call that commuter tax. You can get other, any kind of other uh, uh, name that might be a hot button name out there, but that is an issue that they should address. Uh, Mr. Bremer, doc, Dr. Bremer did sc discuss it. He didn't use the word commuter tax. He issued, discussed the responsibilities of the region for the Corps. But they do need to do that, and you need to listen to them with respect to that. And not only that, other issues that are before the Congress only for their consideration. The, re uh, the pension fund, unfunded pension liability, $4.2 billion for benefits that were voted from 1918 back up until now. The benefits that our police officers, firefighters, teachers, and now judges are getting are coming from benefits that the Congress legislated but never provided a funding mechanism for. So we're spending $360 million a year now just to pay as we go with respect to that. That has to be faced not only by the board and the council, and the council has faced it. We work cooperatively with Congresswoman Norton with respect to that, but the Congress is going to have to face that as well. The board needs to get into that. We look forward to the board doing more of that. There are other issues as well where we're going to have to look to the board to face you uh, in something of the creative tension that they face us as a charge to do what needs to be done. We look to them to join with us in charging you, uh, with a, giving you a challenge with respect to the federal payment. We do not have a formula-based federal payment anymore, but there is a serious need for that for the purposes of planning as well as revenue production. We, we look to the board to challenge you with respect to state functions that have been imposed upon uh, the city of Washington uh, like have been imposed upon a uh, state in which we're welcomed, frankly, by the city of Washington when we wanted to perceive ourselves as growing to state status, but are extremely difficult during the current years of recession. Uh, and particularly in that area, the question of the Medicaid match. We are going to want the board to be an advocate for the city in a team with us to come to you, the Congress, and challenge you with respect to what's needed to put our city in good financial order. The uh, um, we have, if I can be very frank, uh, Mr. Chairman and members, uh, the Congress has been a part of the problem. We've had more difficulty in going through this, frankly, with the uh, actions of the Congress than we have with the actions of the board. We've come to some 
communication and some working relationship with the board. Uh, and then we find everything's undone. I gave you a, a couple of examples, one sort of a major one, one a very relevant one. Uh, the question of how we first handled the FY96 budget. We were uh, charged by the board uh, to come back with certain uh, quantitative results with respect to FTE reductions. We did that. It, it was a difficult task, but we did it. When we came before the Congress with that budget, uh, we brought it up, the mayor brought it up, uh, and the board brought it up, and the chairperson of the subcommittee on appropriations of the district for the District of Columbia, the committee on appropriations, congratulated the council, congratulated the mayor, and I believe he congratulated the board. Uh, and we all felt very good. We finally achieved something, and we could do what one board member told me one time. Now that we got through, when we get through the FTE issue, we can move on to the other issues we want to get to, like those that I just discussed. Well, it turns out, in a matter of a week or two weeks, uh, the subcommittee on, a, on the District of Columbia, the Committee on the Appropriations, said, oh, we want more. Uh, first, it was going to be $250 million more. Then it was going to be $140 million more. Well, it wound up $150 million more. We want more cuts. So the board had to go back to try to uh, go back into the budget, get away from these other issues that we were hoping to get through, getting away from that plateau from which we were hoping to move to other issues, and go back and try to cut some more to the 4.9. Then uh, we thought we had found the way of doing it. We thought it's an accounting issue, and it was the question of double counting. The Congress had provided that we had to do a gross, base, gross budget pulling all the revenues together and all the expenses together. And when we looked through that, we found that a number of places we were double counting, like the one I just told you, where a dollar comes down into revenue and goes to agency A, is moved over to agency B, say the lottery, comes in the lottery from the gambler, and then goes over to agency and then spent for services. That's booked as two revenues and two expenses. And so we asked the CFO. We didn't just come up with this as a, uh, a thought sitting in the city council office or something. We asked the CFO, he said, well, you're right on that. Uh, we asked other people, in fact, we asked some, uh, at least one member of the authority, you're right on that. But we're told, we were told just now, that a staffer from the Congress said, if you do that, you'll, the Congress will probably just give you a different charge as to what you've got to cut back to. Now, we're trying to follow wisdom of the CFO uh, uh, and uh, respected accountants, and we also called upon uh, certified Public Accountants of the City, the District of Columbia Association of Certified Public uh, Accountants, which have given us uh, some advice in the City Council. We've appreciated it very much, and we find that this is the right way to do it, and we go and try to do it that way, and then we're zinged again uh, because somebody, a, a staffer in the Congress, is opining uh, that that's not uh, what they want to see done. That creates the situation, I, I say it respectfully, but I also ch say it critically, where the Congress is interfering with what it, Congress has tried to create by this board coming together to produce some wisdom about what to do. Uh, and uh, it goes and does something. We go and agree with it to do something. That teamwork is established, and we can't move on because the issue is always reopened. The ante, I call it, they call it the uh, upping the ante. And it leads me sometimes to think that, that uh, uh, about the convenience, frankly, and I'm not charging this as a mo motivation, but I have to observe it as an observation. There's a level of convenience to the Congress that created the unfunded liability going back to 1918, not to face that now, not to face the issues with respect to how it has structured a, a, in a, a region, a vibrant economic region, with the core having 47 percent of its land exempt and 61 percent of its income exempt uh, by the legislation Congress passed itself, not to face that by simply saying we're going to change the budget standards so board. You go back and look at budget again. You go back and look at budget again. Whereupon you go into a cycle. Okay, we reduce, uh, we cut, we produce some more cuts. The cuts reduce some more services. Then reduced services produce lesser revenues. And then we have either deficit 
our demand for more cuts. And we go into an endless cycle downward. And I really submit to, to you, the Congress, that you're partially responsible for that. I guess all I have left from the Constitution is not Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17 anymore, but I still have the First Amendment. So I've just exercised it. And I appreciate uh, uh, the opportunity to come here and do it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me uh, start with the questions. I uh, <clears throat> appreciate both of you coming. I'm going to try to be brief. Um, Mr. Clark, let me, let me start with you. I've, you know, how, we are going to be considering tax reduction for the city. How in the world can I support tax reduction for the city when you're talking about a commuter tax for the suburbs? I mean, let's get with the program. We've moved beyond that. Mayors moved beyond that. Control boards moved beyond. Ms. Norton's moved beyond. It isn't going to happen. And just to be real clear about this, this is a nation's capital. It's not the suburban capital. And I think if we want to address more money, we, we can do that through the federal payment. That's the appropriate well, that's, way. Well, but I, we need I, to just get off this bit altogether if we're going to work in a cooperative manner. I just want to make that comment. I appreciate it. I know, I know you would like to make that because I guess this has got wider circulation than just here. But the, Congressman Davis, uh, there hasn't been an ill bill introduced on the federal payment. There hasn't been any motion through this committee uh, on the federal payment. There hasn't been anything with respect to that uh, being done. It is an option out there. Uh, the issue is we're, we're having trouble just getting the, well, the basic I, you, federal payment through right now. But we, I think that is the appropriate route over the long term. Well, had been, been a bill introduced on the commuter all right, tax. But I'm it, saying I want, my board, I want my board up here uh, arguing that case, too. And that's not the only thing we, we presented to but you, Congress. Let me, let me ask you another question. All right. Reading the paper this morning on this uh, UDC protest, and uh, sometimes the paper gets these things wrong. I just wanted you to get a chance to see if I uh, misquoted that you were sitting down on the street last night with the students in the middle of, of Connecticut Avenue. It was a show of solidarity saying that we are dealing with an unjust situation. Just the chairman of the city council doing that? I went up to th uh, address the students up there, and they asked me to sit down. And I, I where, sort of, where? In the, in the middle of Connecticut Avenue? Well, they had a... a, a, they had a um, what is it, a, a, a satchel, you know, somebody with a head of satchel, sit down. And so I just sat down. It wasn't shown a sign of solidarity. They said, we just sit down. I sat down and got tired real quick because I'm pretty old and got back up again. I did not say that as a question, a point of solidarity. I went up there to talk to the students about uh, uh, commending them, uh, frankly, uh, for exercising of their First Amendment rights. I did do that, but also trying to explain to them uh, and did, in fact, uh, explain to them that their, their problems were not with the you control. You don't think board. First Amendment rights include blocking traffic, do you? I wasn't blocking traffic, sir. Well, you were talking, I, I just am asking you, do you think it does? First Amendment, not necessarily. I, I mean, in certain circumstances, the, the Supreme Court has said yes, but no, I was not addressing that. And I wasn't blocking traffic. The police so you weren't sitting in the middle of the road. When, I went, when I went up there last night, the paper was wrong. I'm just glad, really. No, no. So, so you weren't sitting in the middle of the street. Uh, I wasn't blocking traffic, I know that. Well, there wasn't any traffic at that no, point. Sir. There wasn't any traffic, no, <laughs> I sir. I think they'd been deep no, sir. I think the police were in front of you. Were you... Uh -uh. Well, I, I don't need to say any more, and I think that, you, you know, you have to ultimately be accountable to your uh, constituents. Well, then, since you brought it out... But I think it's a sad thing. you brought it out, Congressman, then I'm going to respond let, further. Let, let me just finish. Oh, I, mean, well, I think it's let really me sad it. when your political leaders are reduced to sitting in and protesting looks like in some actions, council actions, when you have every right to appear before this committee, talk to the control board directly and, and everything else. And what we're trying to get, I think, is a get all on the team together. We have differences. Mayor and I have differences. Ms. Norton and I have differences. But we are sitting here trying to work together in a very complicated situation on the Hill where we have members uh, from both parties holding up uh, the payment and everything else. And I just, we're just trying to, to all work together. And I can see the two of you didn't coordinate your statements today before you came up. Um, Let's, we're, 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 we're trying here to get everybody working together. That's the purpose of these uh, hearings. I'll let you respond if you can add any. Uh, <laughs> yes, I'd like to. I'd like to go a little bit further with respect to it. We all have to work together, in, not only in terms of govern, governance and the perspective of this community. The young people up at the university were, were challenged with some unfortunate, erroneous rumors uh, that the whole university was going to be closed down. And I went up to, to them about 9.30 last night and went up and talked with them. And they just did ask me to sit down right where they were. Uh, and at that point, it wasn't blocking traffic, uh, that kind of thing. And I did. And I guess the Washington Post got hold of that. As a matter of fact, the Post reporter was up there. He, he told me, he says, I've already filed for, the, for the, the deadline. I've already passed my deadline. I just sat down there and I did talk about that. And so the Post reflects that. And here comes the congressman saying, OK, I'm being irresponsible with respect to that. 
but I have to go and meet with my people too. And part of what I was trying to tell those young people was that we've got serious budget problems and that we're all having to endure, endure these problems right here in our city. Uh, and, and that and the council had made some cuts. We hadn't cut the, the University of the District of Columbia. We cut it by $2 million to the uh, uh, higher education portion ourselves. We did that, and I told them that. And I told them that we had to do that. And I also told them that under my analysis of uh, what the board had charged the CFO with, he did not necessarily have to apply the 10% uh, restriction unless he found that they were overspending at a rate by which they uh, uh, would go beyond the allocation for this year. And I explained that there uh, to these young people to try to talk with them. We have to deal with our people too, Congressman. It's not just a question of dealing with the Congress and the board. We have to deal with our people. And, and we have to tell our people what the hard tasks are. And so what if we sit down with them when they're sitting down and they feel a little bit better about that, I, 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 I okay. defend Thank you. that. All right, I appreciate it. I mean, I, I know they asked the mayor to sit down. He stayed on his feet, and he acted like a leader in this. And we can agree or disagree in the final outcome. But I, I, I just, I mean, I read this today, and frankly, uh, I, was, I, was, I was appalled. Let me ask the mayor. Mr. Mayor, uh, we, I asked the control board earlier how they felt the relations were working, and you heard every member uh, respond in turn about they thought things were getting better. And frankly, a lot of praise for your uh, transformation plan. You kind of touched on this in your opening remarks. How do you feel it's going at this point? Chairman, as I said earlier, I think the relationship is uh, getting better. Uh, it, it, it did get off to a rocky start at the beginning. And also, I've said this to the board at our retreat, uh, that uh, I had gotten the impression from department heads and other people who work for the executive branch that initially there were some staff people whose attitude was one of uh, gotcha and embarrassment as opposed to helping. Uh, I see that has changed uh, tremendously where there is that kind of cooperation. We still need to have a, uh, a much more uh, involved discussion uh, about the uh, staff relationship. I think we're getting there. There was a time when staff would show up in various agencies, and Mr. Rogers and I myself knew what they were doing and why they were doing that, and we're working on that too. So. Uh, uh, we have made tremendous progress in just the communication between the board uh, and the mayor and an understanding. Uh, for instance, around this whole issue, and Mr. Norton discovered this uh, when I had a meeting in her office, there was some view that I had not wanted to be cooperative about the, this delegation of authority. That had never been brought to my attention. That was just talked about around. Mr. Williams hadn't brought it to my attention that he was concerned that way. There had been no face-to-face -face discussion with me with members of the board of the staff. And once we had that discussion and dialogue, they discovered, as Ms. Norton discovered, that I wanted to be helpful and be cooperative. So that's beginning to, to happen more and more. We still need to probably talk more. And I think the vision has given us an opportunity to, to, to do that. Uh, when we were meeting in our retreat, uh, Ms. Harlan, for instance, talked about uh, uh, providing opportunities for success. And so I think you're going to see that uh, in my State of the District Address. I want to invite you March 25th at 730, Lincoln Theater. Uh, that vision, so once we can agree more on where we want to go, it's much easier to then decide what vehicle that we use to, uh, to get there. And I guess the bottom line is, uh, it, the, it is it is improving. On the other hand, what you said was correct. Uh, there will be times when I'm going to say to the public, the board made this cut. I disagree with it. I disagree with the UDC cut, for instance. I disagree with that cut of $2 million. Uh, and I think increasingly as we define what the board sees as the role of the CFO and the percent of the time he ought to be paying attention to me and paying attention to them, it'll probably get better. For instance, I was telling Michael Rogers that during the budget preparation process, that ought to be a relationship where Mr. Williams and myself have a hundred percent attention to me and not the board. And in the revenue estimating process, there will be a time when there's hundred percent attention to the board in terms of, of uh, where you put your energy and put your time. But I think we can work this through even better now as we think about it and work on it. I don't think there's any need for the, uh, the Congress to provide any clarification here at this point. Okay. Okay. No, th thank you. Um Thank you very much on that. Let me just, if I could, just acknowledge that we would had three members of the council here besides the chairman. We had Hilda Mason, 
saw Councilman Smith and uh, Councilwoman Jarvis here. We appreciate you being here with us. <clears throat> we are going to try to call today our CFO and our new uh, uh, Inspector General, but I want to give you appropriate time. And it, we're, we're, we're very compressed, and I apologize, but since we're due to hear you next week, I'll call you first next week and give adequate time for you to uh, uh, comment accordingly, have questions. You might want to even revise it a little bit in light of some of the comments here today and give you uh, the last word and just to say to both of you, uh, I appreciate what you're doing. You've got a tough job uh, wading into this kind of thing. We want to be helpful in every way we can as part of the team. And I'm glad to see uh, uh, with, this, uh, with the transformation plan moving on, we now have a blueprint that we can all work off. Uh, there'll be changes to that, of course, as we move forward. But it's changing the dialogue up here on the Hill among some of the detractors of the city and everything else, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, if we can stay on this message, if we can stay on this plan and adhere to it, I think we are going a long way toward uh, creating an atmosphere up here where we can accomplish some of the other things we want to do. And I just I want to say that uh, as the chairman of this committee and having talked to a number of my colleagues on my side of the aisle. I'll now yield to... Mr. Uh, chairman, let me just make a couple of points before Ms. Norton. Is that, uh, and I'm going to continue to talk to the board about this, I think it's a mistake to lump the CFO and the Inspector General in the same, same category. Uh, what the CFO does is vastly different. It affects this government vastly different than, this, than the Inspector General. The Inspector General is investigatory, weight, uh, waste, fraud, abuse, control, et cetera. And she could go for f three or four, five, six, eight weeks. If I didn't talk to her, it would not have the same kind of impact on the government as a decision to withhold 10 percent of one's budget or a decision to, uh, to, uh, to require certain important relationships. So I think as we talk with the board, it's a mistake to put them two together, that the CFO is independent, the IG is independent. IG ought to be able to work in a certain area. And again, we ought to talk about the, the differences. And the more we talk about how that works, the better off I think we'll Mr. be. Mr. Mayor, let me, I, say, I agree with that. And in next week's panel, you uh, and, and Tony are on the same panel together, and I have the IG off on a different panel. Uh, That'd be helpful. Yvonne, at that point. And I think that talks about working together. You're not supposed to talk to her. She's supposed to be uh, looking around there. I mean, they run? No, no, I'm just teasing. Oh. But she's, she's out there doing investigations, <laughs> and I don't want you talking to her every day. It's not the way it's supposed to work. But uh, <laughs> let me talk, uh, you know, now yield to the uh, representative from the city, the ranking minority member. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to associate myself with those remarks. The, the, whole, the whole point, uh, uh, as the mayor has laid out, is to effect, is, is to get a wall between the city and the IG so that the IG would feel that she can go wherever the trail takes her. But the whole point of the CFO and the mayor is that the job cannot be done unless both of them are doing it in the way contemplated by the statute. And I want, I want my, my one question to you, Mr. Mayor, relates to that. First, may I personally thank you for uh, the way in which you personally move forward that meeting. I mean, before I had time to do virtually anything, you had offered a solution to the problem. That convinces me that this statute can work. The solution apparently had, 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 that was not one that the CFO and you had had any communication about. Um, I, I have, as I said in my, in, in my own statement, written down what those agreements were, but I want everybody to see them before I put them into the record. And I, again, I want to thank you and, frankly, everybody in the room, but especially the initiative you took, because once you take that kind of initiative, everybody around you and, the, and, and for that matter, uh, the authority staff then sit up and, and notice that there's a problem solving, there's problem solving going on and everybody ought to be part of it. Uh, I want to engage in just a little statutory interpretation because I understand your frustration and I do believe that if one looks at this statute, the problem you see with budget formulation that you say in, uh, that you indicated uh, in your remarks uh, you'd like to have changed doesn't have to be there if, in fact, the CFO and the mayor operate as the statute contemplates. Now, first of all, why was the CFO given the kind of authority he has over parts of the budget in the first place? And I just want everyone to understand, as the person who had to, to go back and forth on this particular item time and again, is that the basic the basic theme of the statute, in a real sense, is reflected 
in the CFO provision, and it comes out of the experience of insolvency and the GAO. The Congress did not know that the district was insolvent until it ordered the GAO in. This has left a searing impression on the Congress that it did not have the information and the city sunk. And so, in a real sense, everything in this statute is geared to getting information. And again, we have one of the little awkwardnesses here that I think can be straightened out. Now, the mayor, over and over again in the statute, the mayor and the city council are left with the authority they had before. There are slight differences here and there. Uh, 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 for example, uh, Mr. Clark knows in, in, in approval of some of the, the uh, mayor's cabinet and so forth, but there are slight differences. But over and over again, the mayor and the council's policy-making authority is, is kept intact. That's why I'm concerned uh, about what you say about ANC's ta tax commission. I can't imagine what that has to do with um, the authority. If, 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 if you, it, it, it seems to me a straight out policy. But if one looks at the statute, Mr. Mayor, the statute when it talks about your authority um, says um, that the mayor shall develop and submit, et cetera, a plan, a financial plan, and a budget for the District of Columbia. That's exactly what you do now. That's exactly what it says you continue to do. Now, how does the CFO get in this? It says that the CFO uh, shall have the following duties, and I'm quoting, preparing the financial plan and budget for the use of the mayor, et cetera. Now, the way I read that is that he's got whatever you had last year. He's got a format. He comes in and he puts, because he, he, he and nothing is going to change Congress on, on his uh, authority to say what the revenues are. He comes in and he says, this is how I see it. This is where I think the thing should go. You can take that and change it in any way you want to, including turning it upside down saying, well, you fund the police department, I say defund the police department. I don't, I'm not going to say it as an, extre as an extreme example. <laughs> <laughs> you better not. No, no. But, but what I, I don't see why these two sections cannot be made compatible since the chief thing he's responsible for is seeing that you do not form, formulate a budget that overrides the, the assessment of revenues that come from the CFO uh, and, I, and, and only that purpose. So I don't understand why this can't work. Ms. Norton, uh, there's several things that, are, that ought to be pointed out here. That all of the budget information, all of the expenditure trends, by object class, by responsibility centers, by control centers, all that information is either in the controller's office or the budget office which means if I want to go in a different direction, I have to have the information to do so. Now, we've not had that much of a problem saying that it is possible, though, that I won't have the correct information, and therefore I'll make a decision that seems kind of, kind of, kind of crazy. That's the budget preparation part of it. The other part of it, and I hope it's been corrected, that during the 97 budget process, there was some discussion in the public arena by um, maybe the staff or one or more of the board members saying if the mayor doesn't send us a budget, we're going to ask Mr. Williams to send us one. Now, that is wrong to say that. If he doesn't do it, I'm, we're going to ask Mr. Williams to send one. That creates an atmosphere, not a cooperation, but a confrontation. And uh, so I think it's a matter of the information being there and the frustration of it, and also the fact that uh, without getting into in town, in, any kind of internal time frames, uh, it is not as easy to, to get a, a schedule that one keeps when, when there's this conflict and tension between the board, what they want, and what I want. But we're going to work it through. It, I'm just saying, if I had my druthers, and we still may want to look at it in the future, the, the mayor needs to have a budget preparation uh, team that he or she has absolute control over without any 
what happens him as a But they're not going to accept, they are not no. going to accept, Congress will not accept, and the authority by statute cannot accept any estimate of revenues except what comes out May, may I finish? I said earlier, I agree a thousand percent that the revenue estimates ought to be in the hand of the CFO, and I can't do anything about it, don't want to do anything about it, maybe have a discussion with him about it before he sends it over, but I don't want to change that. I don't want to change the budget execution. That is to make sure once the budget is adopted, that the controller function and the other functions of, uh, of uh, budget execution are adhered to to make sure that these departments don't overspend their budget. So I separate out budget preparation from revenue estimation. Mr. Williams would say to me, we have $5 billion. Here are my recommendations, how you ought to spend the $5 billion. Then we go back and forth on it. And I say, well, here's what I'm going to send to the council. And the other, the other problem, I, I, that's not a problem at this point, but it may become one, and it, it's, it's, it's gotten closer to that sometime. If I make a policy decision about, say, take the police department, that we're going to fund them at 3,800 uh, positions, and it falls within the revenue estimate, I would hope that the CFO would support that policy, as opposed to I didn't agree with that policy, and uh, uh, even though it doesn't have any financial implication, that busts the budget. So that way you get torn between what he supports and what I support. I'm sure that those are things we can work out, because obviously that, that the statute contemplates that the policy decisions, you're right, will be made by you and the council, and only you and the council, and, and the board, and, 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 the, and, and the authority, and the CFO. Uh, are beholden to your policy choices. But these are things, again, that I think can, can be worked out, I think, in terms of having access to the proper staff in your own budget preparation. I think that can be worked out, too, with an understanding and an agreement of the kind we've begun already to reach. I just want to move on to Mr. Mr. Norton, Clark. Norton, I'm going to again reemphasize <coughs> that if, if Mr. Williams, or, well, let's, take, let's not personalize it, if the CFO said we have $5 billion dollars, and I want to send a budget over to the council that has $5.3 billion. There's a proper role of the CFO to say, no, that's not, that's not, that doesn't meet revenue estimate. That doesn't do that. But I go back to the policy decision. If I make a policy decision to fund something, then I don't want people saying, well, we can ask Mr. Williams or ask the CFO his views about it, and they're going to be different on a policy yeah. level than the mayor. I understood, That's understood, and I, th and I think we can, I think we can work on that, and I think we can straighten. That. Those are the kinds of things I think we can straighten out, assuming that's even occurred. Uh, Mr. Clark, uh, uh, I, uh, first, let me say how much I appreciate your tax revision notion for, for DC taxes, because it'll help me in what I'm doing for tax uh, reduction for DC. Although I think. We may need to do some things if this bill goes to the floor, as uh, leadership seems now to contemplate. We may need want to do some things not to lower taxes immediately, but to indicate where you all think taxes are going or might be uh, reformed. Well, I'm uh, working on, as a matter of fact, this morning when I came here, last night I was working on a piece just to do that, recognizing that you're about to initiate some efforts up here um, to, uh, to do that. And I hope you find that. it attractive. I appreciate the work you all are doing on that. Yeah. Uh, let me also say, you, you mentioned two, the, the items you mentioned were, I think, the realistic places to look for revenue. I, I, I regard a chairman ought to, ought to, uh, low, uh, ought, ought to just be calm. Uh, I regard uh, commuter tax as a throwaway. Uh, that is to say, if we get some, some, uh, something else to take its place. Um, but when you talk about the uh, federal, uh, when, when you talk about pension liability, and I know you're working on a bill, and when you talk about the federal payment formula, there is bipartisan agreement on both of those issues. The only problem is how much on both of those issues. So we're working on the things where we think at least the Congress understands it has an obligation. I, I, and I do want to say for the record, no, you did not oppose the control board. I, I consulted with both you and the mayor. You were not an obstructionist in this. And DC was going to have a pay list payday. We had, had to have some way to borrow, and th there was nothing of that, and you mentioned that. Um, the council, at the end of the four-year period, in effect will become the control board for the District of Columbia. And in a democratic society, that's really how it would work. We wouldn't have a control board if we weren't insolvent. But the control board will go. 
and it is in checks and balances that the functions of the control board will be carried out. Um, I was uh, uh, very, I, I, must, I, I just want to say that your recommendations are a most extraordinary piece of work. And I'm going to ask the control board, the mayor's office, and everybody to look at it. These are recommendations uh, that are at the back of the testimony. I won't, you, you mentioned some of them. I won't go down them all. But some of them ha are, are of such common sense that they almost, he, the, you, what you, you almost lay out a way in which this system could work. For example, effectuate an intergovernmental operating agreement between the authority, executive, and council consistent with what was done in Philadelphia. The great lack in Washington is nobody pays any attention to Philadelphia, which has gone through this whole thing. The authority doesn't pay enough attention to it. The city hasn't paid enough attention to it. Clearly, the council has. Improve information sharing staff to staff and board to council. I'm just reading some of these out. The authority should be more accessible and proactive involving both the council and the mayor in its preliminary and post-budget making activities. Each contact with the authority is always of a formal nature. That ain't going to work. That's right. Unless people can sit down in a room before the budget comes in, after the budget comes in, talk it out the way they did in Philadelphia, the contention will continue. It's an excellent recommendation. The authority has been in existence for nine months now and should begin to focus on the management assistant component of its mission. Amen. The, 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 if anybody, the more I know about district operations, the more I know there is a lot of money down there. I mean, what the mayor is going to do on Medicaid. I mean, when you look at the difference between what Chartered Health charges the district and what welfare uh, recipients pay when they just go to wherever they want to go, you just see dollars coming, uh, coming at you. Anyway, this, this is a most important kind of beginning blueprint. In light of that, I, wanna, I, I don't recall, Mr. Clark, whether you were or, or members of your staff were a part of the budget summit this summer. Yeah, that, my, that is the case. Yes, our staff was a part of it. I'd like to have you, uh, I, I'd just like to have you first and then the mayor, uh, or perhaps uh, Mr. Rogers, describe how that worked, because that is the one instance in which we saw no contention, no agreement, no hearings, no spitballs, but somehow everybody came out with one document. It was approved by the council just like that and, and almost as quickly by the authority. Um, well, um, the staffer who represented the council is not here, um, and the staffer brought me back uh, the results of that uh, uh, colloquy. And I found as between council, as members of the council budget staff, when they get together without the council members, uh, they can produce some really good recommendations, and they've done that. And, <laughs> and we've relied upon them. We've relied upon them as a body for what they've done. And that can operate in, in interagency as well, and it did at that budget summit. And we were very pleased with what came out of it. But there's only been, I think, two times, um, maybe even only once, uh, that the mayor and the council as a group met with the board as a group. And that was in August. That was in August of uh, uh, last year. Uh, and so it's infrequent, unfortunately, when that occurs. Uh, but we have urged it. I continue to urge and, and continue when I got a chance to go to the board meetings to say to the board, and I expect their minutes, if they keep minutes, will reflect it, that I continue to urge the budget summits be reinstituted and we go forward. The council has always been there, and it is a very good idea. Mr. Rogers? Uh, me, let me say that... Um, the budget summits in August worked because there was a will to do so. There was a clarity of mission on the part of the authority staff as well as uh, the executive and legislative staff. Uh, in the intervening months, there, um, have, there have been dialogue, uh, but the chairman is right. Uh, we have not had the kind of uh, uh, discussion that we had in August, and uh, I think uh, I agree with him that it's time to return to that format so that we can uh, get our communications uh, back on track. The total information sharing that, uh, that apparently occurred there with, with, uh, with agency heads coming in and laying it all out, because it's going to come out anyway, 
and, and the hammering it out among yourselves and producing a document that the council felt confident enough in so that it didn't have to spend a lot of time on it. I, I, I commend you on that and hope that, that that model will be taken up in the future. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. And let me just say, inclusion, Mr. Clark, uh, just to, I think your tax review commission idea is very important. I think restructuring the tax code uh, has to be done to keep and attract people, businesses in the city. I think it complements some other things we're trying to do here. And I hope uh, you can work with the mayor uh, uh, along those lines. Thank you, everybody. Once again, I want to apologize to our chief financial officer and our Inspector General, we'll hear from you first to next week uh, as, as you come forward and give you an opportunity to uh, present your, your views at that point and take questions. We'll work with you in the interim. Uh, next week, uh, we'll have another hearing with the same witnesses on the financial and management status of the city. The hearing will be held at 1 p.m. in room 311 of the Cannon House Office Building. The subcommittee will continue to work with all interested parties in an ongoing effort to resolve the issues raised by these hearings. and. Uh, Without objection, I'll hold the record open for 30 days. These proceedings are closed. The subcommittee's next hearing is scheduled for March 28th. Our 1996 Congressional Directory helps you follow proceedings in the House and Senate. It includes biographies of members, committee assignments,